right uh good morning uh afternoon or evening depending on where you are in the world watching this um hopefully we're going to be getting people start to uh log in we've started at uh, 9 55 just to give me a few minutes to uh, just talk through the housekeeping rules um, so this webinar is going to be recorded. It's going to be recorded and next week it will be available on YouTube as well as the BSSH website. Um, there will be attendance certificates. If you stay for the entirety of it all, then I believe it's a three CME point um, allocation and they, those will be available and sent to you at the end of next week. Um, the questions, if you have questions during it, if I could ask you to please submit those via the Q&A function and not the chat function. I can't guarantee that all questions entered into the chat box will be answered, but uh, we'll try and answer those as we go along. Uh, and there will be an opportunity for questions halfway through and also at the end as well, um, where we'll open it up uh, to the panel. Um, I'm going to now share my screen just to show uh, the order of events um, for today. Okay, so here we go. This is uh, the timetable. So at uh, 10 o'clock in a few minutes time, uh, we're going to start with Philip Matthew, who is an orthopedic uh, hand consultant at the Chelsea and Westminster Hospital in London. Uh, his topic is on extensive tendon anatomy, so it's one to five, and then discussing swan neck, boutonniere, and mallet finger deformities. Uh, following on at 10.30, there might be some, these are rough times, we'll, we'll see how we go, but will be uh, Mr. David Bell. He's a plastic surgeon specializing in hand and microsurgery at the St. Helens and Knowsley NHS Trust in Prescott, just outside Liverpool. Um, he's going to be talking on extensive tendon reconstruction proximal to zone five and also soft tissue coverage. Um, at 11 o'clock until 11.30, we've got the very important role of Pascal Smith, who is a hand therapist at the Queen Victoria Hospital in East Grinstead. And she's going to start by talking about the surgeon therapist communication and the importance of it, following by protocols and splinting for extensive tendon rehabilitation. Then we've got um, 20 minutes for questions on extensive tendons. And so if we've got some questions in by then, I'll ask the panelists to review uh, what those questions are and uh, hopefully we'll be able to, to answer them. So some of those will probably answer directly to individual people. Um, and others will be then answered to the audience uh, just so everyone can hear the answer. We'll, we'll get uh, Katie, who is going to be helping us with our um, uh, running the program. Katie uh, Dixon, she's an ST4 registrar in plastic surgery in the Midlands rotation. And she is going to um, basically uh, save, up, save up some of the questions which can then be answered to the wider audience. Then I will take over now. We're going to ask a poll in a second. In fact, we could put the poll up now because um, we know that some of you have uh, attended yesterday for the first part of the tendon workshop, um, which uh, was the held at Manchester University. And um, we're just wondering how many of you actually attended that um, because that will slightly depend how much detail I go on to in the, in the next uh, phase of the talks, which would be uh, secondary tendon reconstruction. Uh, on the original timetable, it was not going to be covered widely in on the Friday and for the Saturday, which unfortunately was not available for LMIC participants. Um, and, and instead this talk, this, these talks were being arranged, um, was meant to cover most of it. But I, I understand that, that some of it might have been covered yesterday. So it just gives me an idea of the size of the audience. Then I'll talk a little bit about uh, a tendon turnover technique, which I, I use quite frequently. And uh, finally, we're going to finish with Subod Des Deshmukh, who is a consultant orthopedic in hand and upper limb surgeon at the Royal Orthopedic Hospital and Sandwell and West Birmingham 
hospital as well as being a um, professor in biomechanics in Ashton University in Birmingham. Um, so uh, I can see from the thing that most people didn't attend yesterday. So I think I will therefore probably give the majority of my tendon reconstruction talk although it mainly is applying to flexor tendons and most of this is relating to extensor tendons that there, there is overlap just with the technique so I will just go through that in that stage. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, I'm going to hand over to Phil Matthews for the first talk. Thank you. Bill, you're muted at the moment. It'll be good to go in a second, sorry. Perfect, okay. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're joining in from. Thank you for joining us today. And I'd like to thank Tony for the kind invite today. Um, my remit is to cover a bit of extensive tendon anatomy, central slip injuries, mallet, and swan neck deformities. I'd like to thank a few people who have kindly allowed me to use their images in this presentation. I have no disclosures and there's no conflict of interest to declare. So about the anatomy and the function, when we look at the extensor tendon, it's, it's a very, very interesting combination of structures that come together to perform, I think, multiple functions. I prefer to call this the dorsal apparatus rather than the extensor tendon or extensor hood as such, because there are multiple elements involved and part of the structures help to flex the MCP joint. So it's more appropriate terminology to call it the dorsal apparatus. Brief overview of the zones uh, described by Verdun, you have zone one, which is usually the distal interphalangeal joint. Zone two, the middle phalanx. Zone three, the PIP joint. Zone four, the proximal phalanx. Zone five, the MCP joint. Six is the dorsum of the hand. Seven is the wrist. And eight is the distal forearm. Now, focusing on a particular digit, you have the extensor digitorum communis, which comes from the forearm into the hand through the extensor retinaculum in the fourth compartment and moves across the MCP joint. Um, and sort of then narrows down into a very tight structure called the central slip. It has its attachment. And then the rest of the function distally is through a variety of interlocking structures, which we'll discuss in a few minutes. The sagittal bands run across the MCP joint and they're fairly static and help to centralize the extensor tendon and keep it exactly where it is. It's a relatively fixed structure. As mentioned earlier, the central slip continues on to the attachment on the base of the middle phalanx, which is the central slip insertion. Most people refer to this bit as a central slip, but it's actually the whole of the tendon distal to the sagittal band, and it's the insertion point that's the insertion itself at the base of the middle phalanx. All of these structures then together join up to form and attach to the distal phalanx through the terminal tendon. There's a whole array of structures that interlock and connect the variety of structures. And these include the transverse fibers which you may find difficult to identify as a separate entity on cadaveric specimens, but the fibers are, are orientated transverse, lie just distal to the sagittal band, and have an important function in aiding flexion at the MCP joint. They are mobile and, and move with flexion and extension of the joint, unlike the specific sagittal band. Distally, you have the oblique fibers, which interlace and attach to the central slip, through the central slip to the base of the middle phalanx. 
The lateral bands are thickenings on the edges of the dorsal apparatus and provide a direct line of attachment for the lumbricals to come and function and pull the distal interphalangeal joint into extension. They go from volar to dorsal, but have other attachments that help regulate the extension of the other joints as well. And these are the, take the form of the conjoint lateral bands. The conjoint lateral bands can, are twofold and they originate from the central slip into the lateral bands and they thus power the EDC the, or the extensor distorum communis to allow extension at the DIP distally. Further, there's a separate conjoint band that goes from the lateral slips into the central slip. And thus the lateral slip, though it attaches distally, has a effect on the central slip at the proxy at the middle phalanx through the central slip insertion. There are three retaining structures or retinacular ligaments, though they're not true ligaments because they don't attach bone to bone. First is the transverse retinacular ligament over the PIP joint, which goes from the volar plate and attaches to the central tendon. And that functions to keep the lateral bands volar it stops it from moving dorsal. Next, distally is the triangular ligament, which has a separate role, which is to keep the lateral bands from going volar. And lastly, you have the oblique retinacular ligament, which goes from the palmar plate, crosses two joints from the PIP to the DIP joint dorsally at the terminal tendon. It has a role in coordinating IP joint movement and provide lateral support. These three retaining ligaments don't have any muscular attachments and are, have a static role but come into play when there's pathology involved. Moving on to the mallet finger. It's a discontinuity of the terminal digital extensor tendon resulting in an extensor lag at the DIP joint. Doyle classified these into four types, and these include closed injury with a small or no avulsion fracture, open injury with a tendon laceration, open injury with skin loss and tendon loss. And then four is the bony components, which can be a, in children a trans epiphyseal fracture, 4B, which is 20% of the distal articular surface is involved in mainly a hyperflexion injury. More than 50% is involved, and that's a hyperextension injury. For the purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus on types one, two, and three. Management options, Doyle one, closed injury is usually treated by splinting. Acute, if it's less than four weeks, delayed if it's more than four weeks, you'd still use one of the type of splints below. On the left-hand side is a stack splint, B is a thermoplastic version of it. Um, and on the right-hand side is a aluminum zimmer type splint, which can be modified for use. Garman and his colleagues showed that the results of early versus delayed close treatment are just the same with splinting. So splinting is just as effective in delayed or early cases and you should always try that as your first line treatment. There was a prospective trial done in 1982, looked at whether you needed to splint them or you needed to internally splint them with K wires, and that showed no difference. And since that study, most of us have been treating these injuries with splinting as the first line. One caveat to this that you just need to bear in mind is that there's a small proportion of people who are ligamentous lax and you need to notice that or look for it to just make sure they don't have a pre-existing swan neck or tendency to swan neck, because in these cases, you may need to include the PIP joint as well. 
If you have an open injury, um, then it's important to directly repair the tendon. One of the recommendations that has been suggested when you have edges that are difficult to get together is to do a back wall stitch like you would do for an arterial repair with an epitentinous suture. Do your core stitch and then continue the epitentinous suture on top to give you a nice closure without macerated or fraying of the edges because that is a common possibility. Sometimes the, the, tenant, the stitches cheese wire through when you do this without the epitentinous suture. Now, there are three different options available for um, extensor tendon loss of the type threes. One, one option that's been described is the hemi, sorry, is the hemilateral band transfer where you take parts of the lateral bands on either side, keep it attached at its distal end, flip it across and suture them back together to any remnants of the terminal slip. Another technique that's been described is interposition tendon grafting, where you can harvest a palmaris longus tendon, drill hole through the terminal phalanx, and stitch that onto the remnant of the proximal bit of the tendon. If you have multiple digits involved and you're sacrificing a digit because it's not viable, you can use the extensor tendon from that digit as a tenon transplant or allograft to fill in the defect in the tendon, in, in the digit with the extensor lag or extensor tendon injury. There are a variety of procedures described for the chronic mallet, and these include excisions of the scar and tenorafi, reattachment back into the bone, plication of the heel tendon, tenodermodesis, Fowler tenotomy, spiral oblique retinacular band reconstruction. And these have varying results. The spiral oblique retinacular ligament reconstruction is used when you have a secondary swan neck, and that has shown good correction of the extensor lag as well. One millimeter lengthening of the terminal extensor tendon will cause a 20 degree extensor lag. If you have less than a 30 degree lag, consider one of the procedures, including a faudal tenotomy. But if you have more than a 30 degree lag, consider a spiral oblique retinacular ligament reconstruction. So essentially the, the lateral slips have a direct attachment to the distal phalanx. When you are a few months down the line and the scar tissue has connect, there is continuity of the extensor tendon. If you do a Fowler tenotomy, the pull from the central slip is taken away. The lateral bands then tighten and allow extension of the DIP joint. And that's the principle behind the Fowler tenotomy. And Bowers has described a technique where you make a lateral incision incise the transverse retinaculum, lift up the lateral slips, find the attachment of the central slip and, and detach it. It's important that you communicate with your hand therapist and your patient for the standard non-complicated mallet, you splint full time for eight weeks. And at eight to 10 weeks, you check for lag, continue splint, but commence weaning to a night splint. And 10 to 12 weeks, you use a night splint and gradually allow them to go back to their activity. If you can, it's important to make leaflets that you can give to the patients in, in the language that they can understand. So they have control over their treatment as well. We're pretty lucky in Chelsea where I work, where we have Excellent hand therapists have designed an app with specific treatment programs, and this is free to use for anyone. You can download the app if you have an Android or an Apple phone, and you, your therapist can then decide which of these exercises to give to your patient. So before we move on, just a quick summary. The aim with most 
non-complicated mallet fingers is to splint. Make sure you look for any ligamentous laxity or swan necks and extend the splint if required. If it's a chronic injury and there's less than 30 degrees of lag, use a simpler procedure like tenodermodesis or phalatinotomy. If it's greater than 36 degrees, I would consider using an oblique retinacular ligament reconstruction. Moving on to the swan neck deformity. Now, this has a specific picture, which is MCP flexion, PIP hyperextension, and DIP flexion. It can be driven through a problem at the DIP, like we've just discussed, a mallet injury, problems at the volar plate or flexor tendon at the PIP joint, or MCP joint subluxations, intrinsic tightness at the MCP joint. As discussed previously, when you have an extensor tendon rupture at the distal phalanx, Overactivity at the central slip and the flexors tend to cause a swan neck deformity. The lateral band then over a period of time translocates dorsally. The management principles are to treat the driving pathology, manage any systemic disease, early involvement of the therapist, you may want a functional assessment done, and surgically thinking about correcting the PIP joint hyperextension. Nalbef classified the deformities in, in rheumatoid patients into type one, where you have full range of movement, no intrinsic tightness, type two, where you have intrinsic tightness, type three, where the PIP joint is stiff in all positions of the MCP joint, but the x-rays are good, and type four, where you have severe arthritic changes. Type one, where you have a good range of movement, you don't need to do much for the MP joint. You can consider splinting, dermodesis, FDS sling, or oblique retinacular ligament for the PIP joint. Or for the DIP, you can consider fusing the joint. A variety of splints exist. On the top is the metal oval eight ring splint. The thermoplastic or the plastic ring splints are available. And on the bottom is the extended splint for someone who may have a problem at the PIP joint with a secondary swan necking or a primary swan necking. So things that you can do surgically when splinting fails or it's not acceptable, you can look at repairing the volar plate or advancing the volar plate if there's been a volar plate injury. One of the techniques described is to make a groove along the volar plate once you've opened it after moving the flexor tendons aside after you have elevated or resected the cruciate pulley. And you can, Miyagi described doing a transverse drill hole, stitching the volar plate down through the transverse drill hole. You can use anchors and advance the volar plate to restore a degree of flexion to the joint. The spiral oblique retinacular ligament um, reconstruction was described initially by Littler. The Lansmere's description, that's Lansmere's original description of the retinaculum tendi longi, which is the oblique retinacular ligament going from volar to dorsal. When the MCP, when the PIP joint is extended, the oblique retinacular ligament is tight. When it's flexed, it's lax. The Littler's description involves using a tendon graft through the distal phalanx going from dorsal to volar and then across the proximal phalanx to hold it in, sort of reconstructing the dorsal to volar construct of the oblique retinacular ligament. So the tendon graft that's harvested is placed below Cleland's ligaments but above the neurovascular bundle. You can use a variety of instruments to tunnel your passages through. The tendon is then tensioned distally, drilled through 
the proximal phalanx and tightened on the other side with a degree of suitable flexion to correct the PIP joint extension deformity. There are alternative techniques you can use like sublimus tenodesis, where the original description shows it being resected distal to the A2 pulley. You make a rent in the A2 pulley at the distal third, pull the tendon through and suture it back onto itself. This is pretty useful if you have a single digit with a problem. It allows you to examine the flexor tendons as well to correct for any flexitina synovitis at the same time. This was described, I think, originally by Curtis, and Nalabuff modified it to doing the suture through the A1 pulley more proximally, where you can suture it to the A1 pulley instead. There are, there's an alternative technique, which is lateral band tenodesis, originally described by Zancoli, where the lateral band is diverted to its volar position by suturing it to the volar plate. And Elliot et al. described a variation of this where the lateral band is then sutured to the palmar plate and attached via an anchor to the proximal phalanx, making it a little more static than the Zancoli dynamic tenodesis. You have to be a bit careful to make sure that these structures are functional before you do the transfers, or they may not work. They may be elongated due to disease itself. In the type two, you have intrinsic tightness, and the classic test for this is the Paul Bun sorry, the Bunnell's intrinsic tightness test. For this, you keep the finger in extension, MCP joint and gently see how tight the PIP joint is. If it's tight in extension, then you flex the MP joint and assess if it's easier, the PIP joint is more lax in flexion. If it's tight in extension of the MCP, but lax in flexion of the MCP, that's intrinsic tightness. If it's tight in both, it's more likely to be a joint tightness. So for this, in addition to all the things that you do in type one, you need to do an intrinsic release. The preferred described technique is a distal intrinsic release where you take a triangular shaped section of the extensor apparatus, distal to the lumbrical and introsia insertion. There's an alternative technique described by Alberto Luke, where you can make a transverse incision at the base of the proximal phalanx, lift up the lateral bands and resect it at that level. Type three, the PIP is stiff through full range, no X-ray changes are seen. For these, you can consider MCP joint reconstruction, which may include sagittal band realignment, MCP joint replacements if that's required, and then focus on the PIP joint as well. You may want to consider a flexor tenosynovectomy or a lateral band or and a lateral band mobilization. For the lateral band mobilization, you do a dorsal approach, release the lateral bands from either side of the extensor in the central slip and gently flex the digit to allow it to flex further. You may need to lengthen the central slip at the same time. When you do a flexitino synovectomy, make sure that you leave the pulleys attached and you may want to splint them in extension afterwards so that when they flex, they don't flex the wrist and they can focus the flexion on the fingers post-op. Type four, if the PIP is stiff through all ranges with X-ray changes, if it's 
you may want to consider a PIP joint fusion. Arthroplasty may relieve pain, but may not give restoration of movement. DIP joints, I would consider fusion. In summary, for the swan neck, address the driving pathology that's causing the swan neck. Get your hand therapist involved early and get them splinted. If the extensor tendon distally is involved, consider the spiral oblique retinacular ligament reconstruction. If you need to do a flexity and a synovectomy at the same time as your reconstruction, I'd consider a sublimus tenodesis. Otherwise, the lateral band um, tenodesis is also useful. Moving on to the last topic, which is the traumatic central slip injury. That's the boutonniere deformity. The central slip, as previously discussed, attaches to the base of the middle phalanx. The lateral bands move and provide attachment for the lumbricals directly to the terminal tendon. The, the triangular ligament connects the lateral bands over P3 and prevent volus subluxation of the lateral bands. In a classic butonia deformity, there's central slip disruption from the middle phalanx. There's attenuation of the triangular ligaments, which allows volar migration of the lateral bands. And they then now flex the PIP joint and extend the DIP joint. Elson's test is a simple test to identify this pathology. And for this, if you flex the PIP joint over a table, ask them to actively extend the PIP. If the central slip is intact, the lateral bands are lax and the DIP will be lax. If the central slip is avulsed, the DIP is now tensed by the activity in the lateral band. So repeating that with the central slip intact, the DIP is flail. With the central slip ruptured, the DIP is tight. A modification of the test has been described where you put the fingers together, as shown in the diagram, and try and extend the DIP joint. If the DIP central slip is intact, you will not be able to extend the DIP joint. If the central slip is ruptured, you will be able to extend the DIP joint. So central slip injuries can be classified as acute or chronic, closed or open. And there are three stages, which is correctable, non-correctable, or non-correctable with joint destruction. Open injuries should be directly repaired and the tendon should be reattached. And then you splint and treat as for a closed injury. In the acute presentation, confirm the diagnosis clinically. Don't forget to x-ray displaced avulsion fractures. And these are nearly always, aside from the open injuries or displaced fractures, they're managed by splinting and you get the therapist involved early. You splint the PIP joint in extension and promote a DIP range of movement, which helps restore the lateral bands dorsally. The lateral bands in this injury are subluxed volar and the continued DIP movement moves the lateral bands dorsally. Short arc movement with the PIP moving to 30 degrees is allowed. Always try splinting first. If established contracture exists, you may need three to four weeks of serial casting to permit extension first, followed by relative motion splinting. Surgery is the last resort. So on top, you have the serial casting over a few weeks to see if we can get the finger out straight. And the principle of relative motion splinting is that MP flexion is good for boutonniere because when you flex the MP joint, the lateral bands are pulled dorsally, the intrinsic relaxes. If you extend the MP, the lateral bands go volar and the intrinsic bands tighten and pull the lateral bands volar. So this is an example of a relative motion splint, keeping the finger flexed at the MCP joint 
which allows for better healing in central slip injuries. For chronic injuries or chronic central slip issues, you can consider a dolphin extensor tenotomy, central slip direct repair, central slip reconstructions, etc. The if you're dividing the extensor tendon with a distal tenotomy, you divide it distal to the triangular ligament and proximal to the oblique retinacular ligament that allows the extensor mechanism to retain its integrity distally. There are a variety of reconstruction methods described, including Palmaris longus tendon graft, Palmaris epineurosis and tendon graft and reconstruction of the tendon directly as well. Curtis stage technique is what's advocated. You first stage involves tenolysis of the tendon, second is resection of the transverse retinacular ligament, third is tendon lengthening and four is repair of the extensor tendon. So the first step is releasing the retinaculum and releasing the extensor tendons. Two is sectioning the extensor tendon, sorry, sectioning the transverse retinacular ligament, which allows the lateral band to then go dorsal. A variety of tenotomies have been described and we've already talked about the distal extensor tenotomy. Last bit in the stage four is the Zancoli repair where you excise the scar tissue and restore continuity by suturing the central slip down followed by the advocated splinting regime. You must also remember to lengthen the dorsal skin. You may even need to put a full thickness skin graft over the DIP joint as you're now allowing it to flex after it having been stuck in the extended position for a long while. Know your anatomy, understand the driving forces that cause the pathology. Important to communicate well with your therapist and the patient and get the hand therapist involved early. For the surgery, it's always important these days to have shared decision making where you tailor the treatment to the patient and the pathology. Thank you for your attention. Excellent. Thank you, Phil. That was a really difficult. That was the most that was the most difficult talk to give because there was so much to cover. And it's I think as he's as Phil has demonstrated so well, it's uh, the anatomy is is much, much harder with the extensor tendons often underappreciated with the the more junior surgeon that the extensor tendons are felt to be easier but i think uh, phil has demonstrated how incredibly complex the anatomy is on the back uh, and and really clearly and beautifully demonstrated the various techniques uh, for reconstruction so we're not going to have questions yet in fact no questions have come through as of yet so please put them into your q a i certainly had a few questions i'll, I'll ask phil in the break uh, once we get there, but I'm going to go straight on to David Bell with the next talk. Thanks, Dave. Okay, cool. <clears throat> Have I unmu I've unmuted myself. Gosh, <laughs> good. Um, yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for that, Phil. I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm just going to carry on from there. So where he started with the, uh, the, the distal zones, one to, to three or four, I'm going to just carry on backwards. Uh, but I'm, I'm then also going to throw in the, the, the curveball of what happens when you have a soft tissue reconstruction that's required as well. Um, because a lot of the things that, that Phil was describing were where you have an isolated injury. Um, where you've got soft tissue injury as well, there are additional considerations um, and uh, the, the additional complications. So actually, I think this um, hopefully will dovetail quite nicely. So... Um, Coming back then to zone um, to zone five and six, you, you have a network of the uh, extensors which have ar arisen. The, so the extrinsic extensors, having arisen from the forearm, come under the extensor retinaculum and then up into the fingers. Uh, and the image on the right there is um, is the arrangement that that Phil's been going through in exquisite detail. Um, 
from a practical point of view with the extrinsics, you have to remember that the, the tendon uh, crosses the wrist joint, and then crosses the MCP joint, the PIP joint before it ends up in the terminal tendon. So the critical thing with reconstruction is that you reconstruct it with the correct length and tension. And we could see with the boutonniere and the swan neck, what happens if even you have a, a millimeter of, uh, of, of misalignment or um, incorrect tensioning. So actually the, the key to a lot of the repair and the reconstruction is getting a very accurate um, extensor length because it's working over multiple joints. There are certain joints where um, a correction can occur. So um, the ECU and um, e ECRL and B, because they're just acting over one joint, uh, you, they're, they're more, um, you know, they're, they're much more flexible with that. But once you get to EDC, then uh, actually reconstruction with the correct length and tension is really important. Uh, the other thing is that the extensor tendons are really, really thin. Um, uh, Phil described a technique where you put in a core suture and an epitendinous. Um, I, I'm not that good. <laughs> um, the, it, in zone one, the tendon's only 0.6 of a, a, a millimeter thick. Um, and it, it's really only when you come back to zone five or six that it becomes thick enough to get a core stitch in. So the tendon My repair that I use is described in greens with a two layer repair. The first is a simple running suture. And this serves mainly to create the correct length in the tendon. Lock that in, and then the second layer is the silver skilled figure of eight that we came across in the epitendinous suture for the flexor tendons. This provides the strength. I tend to use a 4 0 PDS for this, as proline knots can erode through the skin and may need to be removed. If the division is more oblique, the same technique can be used, but there is a step progression in the silver skilled so that the bites are transverse to the line of the tendon fibres, not parallel to the line of division of the tendon. Okay, so um, I, I don't have any particular issue about going full thickness through the extensor tendon when it's, uh, when it's only a millimetre thick. Um, and so the, the idea with that repair is that you do a first pass to get your, your alignment actually right. Um, tendons tend to go a little bit mushy at the ends when they repair, so that um, you're, it, you're over and over, if that's all that you had, um, is, is very likely to give way. So going back with the second layer that provides the strength, um, I, I think is the, is the way of getting the right balance. There's a fair bit of suture material in there though, uh, and, and that's why I favour the PDS and a fairly fine PDS, maybe at 4.0, um, rather than going, uh, going with proline. Uh, I've had a few problems with, with knots eroding through the skin. Okay, so um, let's, let's put that together with um, some soft tissue injuries and see if we can come up with a, a kind of a, uh, a, a, an approach that matches the extensor tendon reconstruction and a simultaneous soft tissue injury at the same time. So the first thing that you do with any soft tissue injury um, is that you debride it so you're back to normal bleeding healthy tissue. Uh, the girl on the top right had a full thickness burn from a a plastic heat sealer uh, and the image on the left at the, at the bottom is post debridement. Actually it's a little bit more than post debridement. Um, you can see on the middle finger and on the thumb that there's an incision um, that, that's healed up from that. Uh, an attempt was made at um, two little adipofascial turnovers which are great flaps. Um, I say an attempt was made, it was my attempt. Um, <laughs> it's a great flap but if you do it in a burn, you've got to consider that the turnover zone um, may actually still be in the zone of injury. Uh, and the only time I've ever lost two turnover flaps is in this case, where I, I made that turnover zone a little bit too narrow, uh, and actually there was an ongoing thermal injury uh, and the flaps failed. So once you've debrided the wound, uh, you, your question then is, is your skeleton stable? Uh, because if your skeleton isn't stable, uh, you're 
uh, you're going to have problems with the uh, with the soft tissue, not not least from a, a pain point of view, uh, but also from uh, getting a functional reconstruction. So your choice then to fix um, is either with a definitive fixation. I'm grateful to Ganga Hospital for these uh, for these images. Um, uh, or you can put in a, a, a temporary external fixation, and that, that partly depends on the amount of contamination that you want to do or how you want to proceed. So having decided on a definitive or a temporary fixation, you've then got to think about, is there an extensor injury? Now, um, if there isn't an extensor injury, you just go straight on to the skin reconstruction, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But the extensor repairs, there, it isn't actually um, a necessary you can consider what happens if we don't reconstruct the extensors. And I'm talking about a little bit more proximally here at, uh, uh, at zone 5-6. Um, Quaba did a, a study. There weren't too many on it. There were nine patients uh, who didn't have an extensor um, reconstruction, uh, but they did have their intrinsics. And six returned to pre-injury work, two changed work for other reason, and one retired. But 90% were satisfied with the function of the hand. Well, what was the function of the hand? Well, they did have 65 degrees short of total active mov movement, but there, uh, and there was a 32 degree extensor lag at the MCP joint, but they were able to get their fingers out straight because of the action of the intrinsics. There was a little bit of a decrease in power grip. But if you're in a situation where you have uh, a completely destroyed uh, extensor mechanism, extri um, completely destroyed skin, but actually from the MCP joint onwards, things are intact, then I think um, one of the things that you can consider is what would happen if I didn't reconstruct the extensors, actually is a 32 degree extension lag acceptable, um, or are they going to need a two, three stage reconstruction? So do, uh, do throw that into the mix. Um, if you are going to reconstruct, which is the, the usual or default, then your choice is to do that as a delayed. Uh, and if you delay it, then you can either just completely ignore it, do your skin reconstruction, and then come back to it later. Or you can place some silicon rods. If you place some silicon rods, just as a, uh, a word of warning, um, you've got to get these bang on exactly where you want to put them. Uh, and you've got to make a decision ahead of time as to whether you're doing a tendon transfer or whether you're doing a graft because if they're slightly off then what will happen is your tendon graft will take a, slight, a slightly curved shape and then with time the the channel that you've created will drift uh, and then you'll get some laxity so you've got to be absolutely bang on with the silicon rod the second thing is that the silicon rod can extrude through if there's only a very, very thin layer of skin over the top. Um, so it's doable, but you've, it, it, it's actually, I think, less forgiving than the flexors. If you're doing a delayed, once your skin reconstruction's completed, uh, you can then go on to extensor tendon, uh, your extensor reconstruction with your tendon graft or your tendon transfer. Or you can proceed directly to an immediate uh, reconstruction. If you're doing an immediate reconstruction with a transfer or graft, it is less operations, it is a faster return to work, uh, and if you've got it well planned and you've got your hand therapist on board and your, ske your, your skeleton is stable, uh, it's a good thing to do. But you can't leave a tendon reconstruction completed without doing your skin reconstruction, you can't leave things open. So you do need to have a plan for your skin reconstruction, um, uh, which, uh, which, which has to take place at once. Uh, and clearly if you're putting in tendon grafts, uh, a skin graft over the top isn't gonna do so well. Okay, so um, again, images courtesy of Ganga. Here's some uh, strips of fascia lata that have been used for uh, a, a multiple tendon reconstructions. They've been taken through the extensor retinaculum and, uh, and, and repaired both proximally and distally. Now, one of the things that's relatively easy to do with the flexors is tensioning because you, you look at the hand cascade and you, you work out whether things are too tight or too loose. But that's a lot harder to do with uh, the extensors. So how do you know if you've got the, the tension right? Well, actually, um, 
I, I suggest that you, you do it like this. You put the wrist into neutral, you put the MCP joints into neutral, uh, and you maximally flex the PIP and DIP joints. Uh, and you put as much tension as you can um, into the tendon at that position. Uh, you put a single stitch in just to mark that. And then as soon as you've done that, extend the MCPs and extend the fingers so you take the tension off but it's marked exactly the level where you want to go so you you set your tension with the wrist straight the MCPs straight the PIPs flexed DIPs flexed maximum tension mark that level take the tension off and do your weave and do your repair like that okay so um uh moving on so with with injuries, um, particularly sort of debriding injuries to the back of the hand, where you sort of, oh, sorry, abrading injuries to the back of the hand, um, the anatomy books say, well, you've got skin, you've got subcutaneous fat, you've got tendon, and then you've got periosteum. And you, you've got these lovely images, uh, there's a cadaveric image from McMinn below um, of, of all, the, all the structures that go on. Um, but, but there's something missing there. And you could say, well, the thing that's missing is, is actually there's a fatty layer and you've got your nerve and your vein. Um, but between the tendon and the periosteum, uh, the books say there's empty space. And if you look in the, uh, you look at anatomy books of the flexor tendons as well, um, within the tendon sheath, it's like, well, you've got the tendon sheath and you've got the tendon inside and it's, it's empty space. Well, that's not quite true because there's, there's a, a functioning layer there which is a gliding layer and um, on the back of the hand and the back of the fingers there's not a huge amount of space between everything that goes on so you've got the tendon gliding through an extremely thin layer with the skin over the top and the periosteum underneath so there is actually a, a, a significant functional problem here with scarring. John claude Gimbeteau um, spent a lot of time looking at um, these areola layers, these gliding layers. Uh, and the image on the left there is um, actually just of some chicken skin being lifted off a chicken breast. And you can see that lovely thin areola layer that as surgeons, we just love to zoom, zoom all the way through because it's a relatively bloodless plane. You can see what's going on and, uh, uh, and, and you just scissor and, and, and diathermy your way through that. If you look at this areola layer really, really uh, in the sort of ultra microscopically, you see that it's made up of a, a, a series of, of networks and those, those bands slide. And within the flexors, you, you have this arrangement. And so you get an uncurling as the tendon slides through and back again. Um, and so this areola layer has a, has a functional importance. This patient had a chronic dislocation of the, the PIP joint and, um, and going back through to do a, a, a tenolysis and arthrolysis, just lifting on the skin, you can see more distally that that areola layer has become a lot more thickened. Proximally, it's a little bit more visible. Uh, and underneath, it's an absolute disaster. You can see that the, the fibrous bands are starting to develop and your adhesions are starting to appear. Uh, and so you can sort of liken it a little bit like this, the, this graphic of the tendon moves and this, this loose layer moves with it. When you have a scar, you get your usual inflammation, prolifer proliferation, repair and remodeling. But it's happening in a relatively small space and it's happening vertically as well as longitudinally. And so this is, this is the sort of the physiological equivalent of taking a drawing pin through the skin, through the extensor tendon and down into the bone, and it locks everything down. Uh, and so at best you'll get the images above, but usually there's no movement at all. Um, while we're on that, what it means practically as well is if you have a wound on the left where you're going to be doing your central slip repair through a very small wound, don't expose as on the right by making a huge axis incision so that you can see all of the extensor tendon proximally and all the extensor tendon distally. Because by doing this, you're going to be disrupting those gliding layers that, uh, that we've been talking about. 
clearly if you need a soft tissue reconstruction then you you can make a, a longer incision than that proximally and back cut it as a hatchet flap and use that as part of your soft tissue reconstruction that's uh, that that's legitimate but don't unnecessarily extend your wounds just in order to feel good and see what's going on um, because there are there are physiological consequences uh, as i'm sure pascal will agree um, so once we've done our extensor tendon reconstruction, then um, uh, it, let, let's just stop and take stock. So we've, we've looked at the skeleton, we've looked at the extensors, we've looked at the skin. Uh, but in your algorithm, I'd advise you just to consider the gliding layers as well. So let, let's come back to this chap. He's a 40 year old mechanic who's who was working on a car engine while it was still working, uh, while it was still turning over. Uh, and he was wearing gloves and the glove got caught uh, and his hand got drawn in and the fan belt abraded over the back of his thumb, index, middle uh, ring and little fingers. So what to do? Um, after debridement, so I'll give you the debridement as your first stage. After debridement, this is what was found. On the thumb, it was just a skin only injury. Amazingly, the EPL was intact. On the index, again, it was a skin only injury. The EDC was intact. Similarly, on the middle finger, the EDC was intact. But coming to the ulnar two digits, they, they'd taken a bit more of a hammer, hammering and the, you'd lost the central slip and the ulnar lateral band on the ring and you'd lost all of the EDC on the little, and there was a charred proximal phalanx over about half of its length. So, considering skin, extensors, skin, uh, sorry, skeleton, extensors, skin, and gliding layers, what do you do next? So, do you debride, allow granulation, and put on five skin grafts? Do you debride, do you syndactylize the digits where you need to, put on a groin flap and do a secondary tendon reconstruction? Do you debride? Do you amputate the little finger? Do you do lots of little local flaps and a delayed ring, um, ring finger extensor reconstruction? Or do you debride, syndactylize, do an immediate extensor reconstruction and put a free flap on the top? Uh, and then have in mind which you do. I'll just give you a second on that. Okay. Make your decisions in five, four, three, two, one, time. So Katie, what have we got? Okay, so debride, allow granulation, skin graft, debride, syndactylize. That seems to be the most popular with the groin flap and then a secondary reconstruction at a later date. Uh, debride, amputate the little finger, local flaps and uh, delayed reconstruction. Um, and then there's a few free flaps. So I'd be interested if you could put in the chat function which free flap you would choose to do. Uh, and um, I'm going to move on. So, um, uh, oh, my mouse isn't working. Ah, thank you. Right. So, soft tissue reconstruction. We have this idea of a rickety ladder of secondary intention, primary closure, uh, local flaps, distant flaps, and free tissue transfer. I think most of us now um, will go to the level that we need and have the concept of a, a reconstruction elevator. And that's, that's a well-rehearsed thing. Um, however, I'm gonna use that as a framework of, of options and what may happen. So if you choose to do a skin graft, um, again, I'm, I'm uh, grateful to, to, to Gang for this. Um, if you put a skin graft on here, you've got no gliding layers. There's, you've got no chance of getting a reconstruction that's going to work if you're directly applying it over tendons um, that allows the tendon to glide. Now, okay, this is an extreme example, but actually it also applies in a very, very small graft. So this lady had um, uh, an injury where a, a hatchway fell on her hand uh, and she ended up with 
uh, an open wound, a bit of skin loss, uh, and a nasty fracture of the, uh, the fifth metacarpal, which was bone grafted. You can see where the bone graft came from on the distal radius, plated, and just the tiniest of tiny little skin grafts that, that, that sort of shrunk into almost nothing. But actually the image you see on the right is of her trying to, uh, trying to flex her little finger. So there is almost no movement at all of this extensor because it's just been locked down to the plate below uh, and to the skin above. So skin grafts, if you've got a gliding layer over the tendon, you can put a skin graft on it. I haven't got any problem with that, but you've got to consider the gliding layer. If, it's, if, it's, it, if your skin graft is gonna act as a drawing pin, then it's gonna prevent the, the tendon movement. So what about pedicle flaps? Well, there's, there's three common pedicle flaps for the back of the hand. Uh, there's the one at the image at the top there, which is a reverse radial forearm. You've got the posterior interosseous flap, um, uh, which I quite like uh, because it doesn't use up any of the main arteries. Uh, the only thing I'd say with the posterior interosseous flap is uh, read the correct paper for this because there are some papers uh, which describe raising it in one way, uh, which has a much higher failure rate. Um, read the one by Agriani from about, ooh, I think it's 1989 or thereabouts. Um, and uh, that talks about reverse flow through a mid forearm perforator. We can talk about that maybe a, a bit later on. Um, so that's the PIA flap. Um, uh, and then the other flap was what eventually I needed to do here. You can barely see it. Okay, I did thin it. This isn't your immediate post-op. Uh, and that's a Becker flap, which is taken down the on the side of the forearm. Uh, and that's based on a perforator coming out of the distal end, about two centimetres proximal to the ulna head. So you've got regional flaps, uh, you've got distal flaps, and, and this is the groin flap or the hypergastric flap, uh, depending on the variant that you're going to use. Um, you can use the, the classic groin flap, um, superficial um, you know, circumflex iliac artery, or, or you combine it with the superficial inferior epigastric artery. And those two flaps, come, uh, those two vessels come together very close. So you can get a six centimeter wide bridge and quite a large flap for uh, a larger reconstruction. Uh, and and this, is, this is great, reliable, quick, simple. If you choose to do a free flap, uh, which some of you have, um, then muscle flaps, uh, serratus has been described because you've got lots of little thin slips. The only thing with muscle is, although it's thinnish and it's a good filler, filler and you've got a slip for each finger, there is a risk of tendon adhesions and you need to put a graft over the top. Um, if you have a, uh, a, a fascial free flap like the temporoparietal fascia or the radial forearm, you can put that in uh, and it's pliable and uh, you can create a gliding layer above and below, but you need to again, put a graft over the top, but that's allowed because you've got your gliding layer. Uh, or you can do a fascia cutaneous flap. Uh, now with the fascia cutaneous flap, you've got the skin, the fat and the fascia. Uh, and there's no reason at all, if your uh, anatomy is suitable for that, why you can't separate off the fascia and create a chimeric flap. Uh, and so uh, this young lady rolled her car, uh, had a debridement of the, the back of the wrist and um, we took an anterolateral thigh flap, which we made uh, chimeric and put some tendon grafts down the middle. Um, and uh, she did rather well, actually, because the, so there was the gliding layer underneath from the fascia uh, and the skin over the top. Um, so back to this chap. Um, I did lots of little local flaps. So the abdominal flap you can take as lots of individual flaps. It doesn't have to be a single one. So little flap for the thumb, little flap for the index, a sort of a T-shaped flap for the, um, the ring in the middle. Uh, and a tiny little flap for the little finger. The, the, I felt that the little finger was unsalvageable because so much of the bone had gone and he wanted to be back at work. So it's more pragmatic to give him an, an amputation here rather than uh, half of P1 was totally charred. I mean, it was black. Um, so we ended up doing that. And uh, this is his photos prior to his central slip reconstruction. Uh, you can see his ring finger comes there. He actually went on to have uh, a, a problem with his PIP joint. And so we took that off as a ray. Uh, so he's had a ray amputation there. Uh, and that's the central slip reconstruction I do, which I gather 
from the previous talk actually has got a name that I didn't know it had. Um, so I thought it was Littlers, which has been adapted, but anyway, it has got a name. So thank you for that, Phil. Um, uh, and then here's another example where you can do little front and back flaps with the heat sealer at the front and at the back. Uh, those are the debridement issues, you, the Im images you saw before. And here you can raise a little S shape in the abdomen and each one comes up as a flap. You then stitch it side to side so you can see those. Uh, and you can do lots of little reconstructions on the uh, soft tissue reconstructions front and back. Uh, and she did all right as well. She didn't want any further scarring on her hand. Um, so there you go. Um, so there isn't a, a single solution for reconstruction that, fit, that best fits every eventuality. You've got to have a stable skeleton. You've got to repair your extensor with the correct tension. You need a quality gliding layer for a good reconstruction. Uh, and you need a decent flap and very, very good hand therapy. Adequate, I think, is, um, is understating it. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks very much, Dave. Another excellent talk. Um, I love talks where I actually learn stuff as well. So I've picked up a few things from that. Uh, being quite a simple hand surgeon working in a place where I can't do free flaps. I think that little S flap that you've just shown there at the end is something I'm definitely going to use. That was that was brilliant. Um, right. Well, we've heard quite a lot of mention of uh, hand therapy along the way, an essential part of dealing with any hand injuries. So I'm going to hand straight over to Pascal Smith to talk about hand therapy. Thank you. Today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about um, extensive tendon rehab. Um, this is a really big topic, so um, I have focused predominantly on the splinting side of things, but I would also like to touch on some of the essential modalities and other key things that I think are important. So first of all, why do we need therapy? Here in the UK, we're really lucky as therapists because we can specialise as hand therapists. And there's roughly 900 hand surgeons and almost one hand therapist to each surgeon. Um, hand therapists can be OTs or physios, but I know this a hand therapist might not be available to you. And really, it's important to remember that therapy modalities can easily be um, taught or training provided to people like rehab assistants, orthotic technicians, nurses, and even you as surgeons can provide some therapy. Therapy aims to restore movement and strength through regular safe graded exercise. We sometimes provide support, splints and casts to protect and promote healing. Therapy aims to restore function and return to everyday activities. It also provides education to patients about their injury recovery and it helps them manage their expectations. This patient understanding of their injury and the recovery process is really important because it also um, ensures compliance. Sometimes involving the family or carers can help. Attend their teaching, invite them to your teaching, invite them to attend ward round or observe your surgery, formulate some joint unit guidelines or protocols for care. It's also important to have some really good, clear instructions or op notes and referrals for therapists. When therapists are formulating a treatment plan for tendon repairs, they need a clear, concise op note or referral. And what do us therapists want to know? 
what is it that the, um, sorry, when was the operation, how has the patient, uh, you know, has this patient turned up one day post-op or one week post-op? This might determine when we start early active motion or the amount of effort in, in the motion that we give them. What have you repaired or even what have you not repaired that still may need caution with movement? How have you repaired it? Is it a good core and epitendinous suture with vented pulleys that we can mobilise early? Or is it a shortened, tight repair which will struggle to flex or extend? Have you tested it? Has it been tested with the gapping and good glide demonstrated on the table? You know, this is not helpful. Telling us just to mobilise is not enough information. So please, surgery cannot be successful without rehabilitation. Utilize the skills and knowledge available in your multidisciplinary team. Therapy doesn't have to be complex. It can easily be delivered by a nurse, a rehab assistant, or a plaster technician, even yourselves as surgeons. Make your instructions clear when you're referring to your colleagues. The details of the operation note impact on the most suitable rehab program for that patient. Get to know your team. Invite them to join you in teaching, in observation, in ward round, and together everybody achieves more. So looking more specifically at tendon rehab, there are lots and lots of protocols for tendon rehab, early passive motion, early active motion, even immobilization, but keep it simple for you and for the patient. Our goals for therapy and tendon rehab are to reduce adhesions, prevent any gap or attenuation at the repair, prevent rupture and increase the tensile strength. Swelling has a huge impact on our patients. It increases for those first three days after surgery. The thickening and stiffening of that edematous tissue starts around seven days, and then the granulation and early adhesions between the tendon and surrounding tissues at nine days. This edema increases the gliding resistance and the work that the tendons have to do. So early patient education to manage edema is important. Encourage elevation, icing and anti-inflammatories if they're available. It's also important to educate and encourage your patients to carry out regular scar massage. As soon as that wound is healed, massage four or five times a day for a good five minutes, firm circular motion with a simple cream or Vaseline. This prevents adhesions between the skin and the tendon, can help reduce the pain, improve their sensation and give motion preventing restriction. So starting at the distal end, splints come in all designs and the key is that thermoplastic splints are not necessarily the best. Using alternatives does not necessarily mean they are second best. Utilize the skills and materials available to achieve the position or requirements you need. Some of these thermoplastics are not affordable to our patients or even accessible to some hospitals. Splinting for zone one extensors or the mallet injuries with thermoplastic alternatives such as Zimmer wire, tongue depressors, plaster of Paris. I've seen one with a plastic spoon and I've even used um, Coke cans or any other aluminium can to maintain that DIP extension. In our unit, we keep our bony mallet splinter continuously for six weeks and tenderness injuries for eight weeks. Educate the patient on the importance of maintaining extension, avoiding heavy use of that hand and how to look after their, their skin and splint. After that immobilization, we tend to wean out of our splint, wearing it at nighttime for a further two to four weeks. We closely monitor any extensor lag or attenuation. The main design for splinting to manage closed zone three central slip injuries um, involves maintaining this PIP extension. Um, we quite often allow that DIP to be free to mobilize and encourage lateral band and terminal end of the tendon notion. This splint can be circumferential, volar or dorsal. 
Um, and we use exactly the same splint design for boutonniers and again encourage the IP motion to um, encourage that migration dorsally of the lateral bands. In my own clinic, um, for zone three and four extensive tendons, we use a regime called the short arc of motion. Patients are seen three to five days post-op and they're splinted in extension for four to six weeks. It's an early controlled motion and it's encouraged from day, encouraged from day five post-op. We give them two exercise splints on top of their extension splint. The first splint allows PIP flexion to 30 degrees, and this motion is increased 10 degrees every week until they get full mobilization in the fourth week. The third splint um, is a blocking splint, and it just allows DIP motion. Passive motion isn't allowed until six weeks, and strengthening starts from eight weeks. Again, there are several different regimes for zone four and five extensor tendons. This regime um, I tend to use for individual tendon injuries and with patients who have a really good understanding of rehab. The top part is called a yoke and around the fingers it holds the MCP joint at 15 to 20 degrees in hyperextension compared to the other fingers. The yoke can also be used for um, injuries such as sagittal, sagittal band repair. Um, for the long extensors, you also include a separate wrist splint, which puts the wrist in 20 to 25 degrees extension. The patient wears this for th these two parts continuously for three weeks um, and must achieve full active motion in their splint. After three to five weeks, the patient wears just the top part, the yoke, continuously, and the wrist um, part is discarded. At five to seven weeks, um, they're encouraged to return to normal activity without their splint. And again, passive um, stretches don't start till like, later on. I just wanted to share these pictures that haven't necessarily been used with an extensor tendon on the left. But again, you can use various materials to achieve the wrist part. And I have um, made a merit regime yoke and splint now in POP. I'm not sure how strong the yoke bit is, but I gave it a, a go. Um, so do utilise what you've got available. The most common protocol which I use for my long extensors, zone four to eight, is this. It's called the modified Norwich early active motion. Um, and patients are splinted across their forearm and wrist with the wrist extended at 30 degrees. And all their MCPs are slightly flexed at 20 degrees and their IP joints are straight. This is worn for four weeks continuously and they're seen three to five days post-op. And they are encouraged to start daily active and um, daily passive and extension passive extension exercises. They also do some um, supported wrist extension, gentle IP flexion. Um, at four weeks, they come out of the splint, uh, wear it just at night time, and passive flexion and strengthening starts at eight weeks and they would return to full hand use and heavy lifting and carrying at 12 weeks. Um, again, I just wanted to share if you haven't got available thermoplastics, um, other materials. I think POP in particular is really beneficial and I would possibly line the POP and this would allow the post-op cast to be used possibly um, once the dressing is removed. Make sure you use plenty of layers to strengthen it and I found somewhere between 10 and 12 allows some good strength without giving a heavy or bulky cast. I've also in the past um, used paper mache formed splints, which are really cheap to patients, and it's particularly useful and beneficial for long-term conditions or um, patients who um, need a robust splint. The paper mache splints are quite timely to make, and I use the process of making the splints 
um, sort of part of hand therapy within my unit um, and as part of the remedial activity for some of my mental health patients. So here I used cassava flour and water, something like one, one to two, um, and then coated it with clear varnish to finish. So finally, looking at the thumb extensor, um, proximal two and zones three to eight, again, an early active motion protocol and the thumb is splinted with the wrist at 20 degrees extension. The thumb's placed mid palmar abduction with the MP joint just slightly flexed and the IP joint neutral. Active and passive thumb extension is started three to five days post-op. And along with this active IP flexion extension with passive um, wrist, wrist extension. Light ADLs start from four weeks and then passive flexion and strengthening from eight weeks and heavy tasks from 12 weeks onwards. So we've covered a lot of the splints today and just before I finish, I would like to just reiterate the importance really of function. When we wean out of the splints and encourage activity, we need to ensure that we promote meaningful activity to the patient. You know, what do we mean by light or medium or heavy activity? Try and consider the role or the profession and the activities that are appropriate to that individual. So, for example, initially light activity may be getting washed, dressed, holding cutlery, um, and then progressing on to medium tasks such as sweeping or collecting wood, using scissors or kneading. And heavy tasks really would be those that involve using heavy tools at work or returning to driving. So in conclusion, I really strongly encourage you to work closely with your multidisciplinary team. Therapy can be provided by your nurses, rehab assistants, orthotic te technicians, and even by you yourselves if a therapist is not available. Educate your team and your patient. There are lots of extensive tendon rehab regimes. Keep your therapy simple. If splinting is required, adapt to the environment around you and utilize the skills and materials you have available. Thank you. So thank you. Um, I just want to add, it on, add on because last night um, I was lying in bed and um, I wanted to just share a slide with you if, I, if you just bear with me a moment. Um, again, this is something that um, I use at the Queen Vicar East Grinstead, and I think it'd be really beneficial um, to share with you. Let me just share this with you. Um, so I don't know if you can see that. Oh, sorry, let me just flick through this. Bear with me. Am I? Yeah. Here we go. So um, what I wanted to show you was a poster which was made by some of the therapists at the Queen Vic here at East Grinstead. And it's laminated and put up in our theatre and also in our clinics. And it's just a um, reminder sheet really for everybody about post-op cast position. So it's not specifically tendons, but I think it might be something that you might be an idea for you in your own units um, to display in theatre or a plaster room or even in the therapy department. Um, so I just wanted to add that in. But thank you very much. I, I know I had to cover a lot of splinting and I didn't cover a lot of theory, but hopefully um, it's given you lots of ideas about lots of different materials that you can use for splinting. Great. Well, thank you, Pascal. Uh, I think that was really excellent, and particularly to include, you know, very much focus on uh, LMIC and resources that might be available. That was that was brilliant. Um, I don't know if it's going to be possible for you to share that poster. If, would, would you think there's any chance we could get that put on the BSSH uh, website as a downloadable poster to be printed up. I don't know if you have to ask I, permission from someone. I would, I would love to. I just need to ask the permission um, of the Queen Vic, okay. um, uh, of my boss. 
Yeah, because that would be really useful. I mean, I have to say, as surgeons, we're often pretty poor at starting the process of uh, of um, uh, talking about the rehab that's going to be required because for the patient, I mean, that's the, the, the harder and longer bit. The easy bit for the patient is to lie there and the surgeon just starts the process of their returning to normal function by doing the surgery. But from then on, it's, it's patient and hand therapist who have the much bigger impact um, and and really, we, you know, it's down to the hand therapists that we get the outcomes we do in the UK. I know that there's probably less availability of hand therapists available uh, in uh, LMIC countries. So it's even more important that the surgeon does have um, some means of communication. I have to say that app that Phil Matthews showed, uh, I, I know that, uh, again, not everyone's going to have a mobile phone, but they're, they're, they are catching on. Last time I visited, I was quite impressed with how many people had one. That that in itself is is a fantastic resource to have, um, and all these little extra information leaflets that you can send patients home with, uh, things in theatre to show junior doctors how to do the appropriate splinting. That they're all going to help with your with your outcomes. Well, we're actually ahead of time now. Um, so this was the point where we were going to open up for some questions about. Uh, extensors because that's the main thrust of the extensor uh, reconstruction and rehab talk done. Um, there were a few questions that I saw uh, posted. Some have been answered, but we might just repeat them. I don't know, Kate, if you could read out the questions and then uh, ask the appropriate uh, panelists to answer them. Um, of course. So the one of the first questions was about uh, going back to uh, Mr. Matthews' talk, Boutonnieres. Um, in the reconstruction of the extensor tendon in lesions in Boutonnieres, is KY used in PIPJ? And if so, how many weeks? Phil, can you just give your answer to what would you, you'd say to that? Ordinarily, no. Um, there's... A, if it's an isolated central slip, as a, I think I would either put an anchor in or if it's mid-substance, try and repair it directly. And I rely on the patient and the therapist to take things forward with splinting afterwards. There are circumstances when it's part of a complex injury where you have collateral ligaments, um, maybe associated with fractures. And in those situations, I would repair the structures that need to be repaired and then assess stability afterwards. If stability is not a major problem, then again, no, I would refer to the therapist splint and uh, rely on the patient to follow the instructions. If um, post fixation of all the structures that I can possibly fix, and I feel that there is a degree of instability still, then I would enhance the repair and add belt and braces with a K wire support for about three to four weeks and take it out at week four and continue the splinting regime. Um, as um, Anthony mentioned in his um, reply as well, there are a subgroup of patients that are inherently unreliable, and these include children. We, uh, I've in, in the last few days on call, we've had about a patient with mental health issues nearly every day in the last few days. And those are patients I would consider to be unreliable to follow instructions, attend appointments, et cetera. Um, so it's, 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 it's a balance in those cases because putting a K wire in is not without risk. They may be lost to follow up with a K wire in, but it adds an extra layer of protection to your repair. Thank you. So next question, Katie. And so the next question was directed more to Mr. Bell and about reconstructing the dorsal hand defects. Um, it was asked, is it worthwhile to use a dermal substitute in a skin, if using a dermal substitute in a skin graft, is it safe to then open it up later for a delayed tendon reconstruction? And I'd like to add on to that, what kind of dermal substitutes do the panel use frequently and like the most? Huh. If any. So, so first of all, no declaration of interest. I don't work with any uh, dermal substitute company. Um, <clears throat> yeah, can you use a dermal substitute? Um, I think you can, I haven't. Um, so in, in the talk, I was outlining principles and the principle is that your extensor tendon um, has to be able to glide. 
So a direct graft's no good. If you put a dermal substitute in, you're effectively creating a gliding layer if your dermal substitute is thick enough. So a lot of the one millimeter ones, which you then put a split thickness skin graft over the top, um, once that's all matured, I suppose if there is um, if there is enough mobility in the skin, once that's matured, then you could very carefully tunnel a, 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 a graft underneath that. I, no, I yeah, uh, I, I don't know if any of you have have tried tunneling grafts under under skin grafts in the past, even when they're matured and you've got that that loose layer. It, 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 it's always a little bit hairy and I, I have on a I have on the one occasion well I have on one occasion had the skin over the top break down where you where you've tunneled through to create your channel for your graft the skin over the top has broken down and you get an ulcer and then you've got an ulcer over the top of your your graft and then it all adheres so um if you really really look after it it's a narrow strip um and there is a very easily defined way of taking a, a, a graft through. Yeah, maybe, but it's it, it's not top of my list. I mean, I work in a place where we we, we rarely, if ever, do free flaps just because of our setup, a very small unit. Um, rather than do a split thickness, uh, I've had quite good results from full thickness skin grafts, but you have to quilt it to everything. Like that's including quilting directly along the, the extensor tendons on the back of the hand. Um, and I, I find that given time, once I use dissolvable stitches, the Vicryl Rapide, um, their space, the quilting stitches are multiple. They're about a centimeter to two, two, two centimeters apart. And I put a pressure dressing over the top. I haven't done it for probably larger than a five by five centimeter defect. Um, but the, the, the tendons will glide again underneath. I haven't done it in those cases if there's then a tendon reconstruction as well. Uh, and, but after six weeks, I get them moving with the hand therapist. And in a couple of cases, rather than use a, 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 a dermal substitute, which is, is, is expensive, um, my choice would be Integra or, or Matroderm uh, out of interest. Uh, then I would, uh, I, you can do fat grafting underneath a full thickness skin graft. And that will also help soften the scar tissue um, and help with the gliding. And it's uh, much cheaper and readily available source as opposed to a dermal substitute. Any other comments from any of the other panelists? No. So next question then, Katie. Um, so the next question was um, going back to a technique mentioned in Mr. Matthew's talk. Uh, do you have experience with the technique reconstruction of the central slip extender uh, using a distally based flexor FDS slip? Um, and I don't think I either Mr. Bell or Mr. Matthew have. I have with Mark Pickford um, oh. and he did it beautifully and worked very well. Um, it, it is quite a big dissection. So you have to open up the front of the finger to, but if, if the, the wound is in that position, then, you know, it might be possible. You have to put a little drill hole through the base of uh, the middle phalanx and pass it through. So technically it's quite tricky. Um, it's not for the part-time hand surgeon. Uh, you need to be, oh, and you know your anatomy well, uh, but but it but it's a very strong repair once performed. But but it, certainly it is, and it, you know Mark Pickford did it beautifully. Um, I haven't done it; haven't been brave enough to do it myself. I tend to use the technique that um, Dave showed with the uh, Palmaris uh, weave through a bone tunnel. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um. Uh, moving on, in the reconstruction of the extensor tendons in zone seven, is it necessary to reconstruct the extensor retinaculum? Mm. Yeah, I, I, I don't think it is. I think it's preferable. Uh, if you've got it, don't bin it. Um, the, it, the extensor retinaculum main, main thing is it, when you hyperextend the wrist, it, is it'll prevent the bow stringing at that point. And there's an, 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 a normal functional normal functional position with 20 30 degrees i don't think you're going to get a huge amount of bowstringing um from that but you will get some um so it, it's better to have it than not have it i think on the the the, the more border um 
flexors, there is a risk of it slipping around the front or around the side. Uh, and, and actually, so it, it, as a restriction to that, it's, it, it, it's possibly useful. So, but if you absolutely can't repair it, I wouldn't beat yourself up over it, is my view. And so would you, you're talking about repair rather than reconstruction, is that right? Oh, no, I mean, if you, if you can repair it, repair it. Um, but most, most of the flaps, if you're doing a fascia cutaneous flap, there's a fascial element to it and that all, uh, you, you, you can cut that down to it. And so that actually that, that acts as a, uh, uh, as a retinacular reconstruction as well. Okay, um, we've got a few more questions. Um, just to add, a few people are raising their hands and I can't work out if you want to ask a question or you've just accidentally pressed the button. If you'd like to ask a question, if you pop it into the Q&A or if you can, you can also pu put it into the chat if you prefer and I can, I can read it out. Um, but I'm not quite sure how to give you the microphone, so apologies. Um, so I think the next question I might pose, I think this is Gillian Smith, hand yeah. surgeon at Great Ormond Street Hospital. <laughs> uh, so I'd be interested to see what she would say to, to uh, <laughs> this question posed by her. But what is your favourite option for reconstruction for wide dorsal hand burn contraction tendon adhesions? Dave, I think that's got your name all over it. Yeah, hasn't it just? Uh, thanks, Jill. I really appreciate that. Um, actually, this might be one of, it, it, like everything, it, it so much depends on patient age, comorbidities, blah, 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 blah. But actually, this is one that you might consider if the fingers are, are good, and here it seems to be a wide dorsal hand burn. Um, this might be one of the ones that you think, actually, do they need their long extensors? Um, bit radical. Um, because if they don't have the, the, the long extensors, they're going to have a 30 degree lag, but actually is that going to give them more function quicker? If you're going to go down the reconstruction route, you've really got to take it back to bare metal and start again. So you are looking at tendon grafts and a flap, and then your flap depends on um, uh, a number of things, an abdominal flap's fine, or, um, or, or a free flap. So, so something like I showed with the girl who'd rolled her car with the ALT flap that if you're lucky with the perforators and there's a, a separate branch going to the fascia, well, you could even split it and do that. Um, but I, I would probably be looking, at, yeah, probably looking at a free flap um, with tendon grafts or, or an abdominal flap. An abdominal flap is as as reliable or more reliable. It's just the keeping them attached to the side for three, four weeks. So, so that's where all the patient factors come in as to suitability for free flap, um, ability to be able to cope with having their, their hands stitched to the side uh, and that. So there you go, I've given you three answers. Well, I think, uh, I think it's an important point to make in that if the patient can't return for rehab, if, it, if the yeah. setup is not appropriate to do a tendon reconstruction on the back of the hand, then the long extensors really just may do the last bit of extension at the MCP joint. And it's your intrinsics in the hand, just to make the point what Dave was saying about not doing the reconstruction on the back of the hand. It's the intrinsics in the hand, which are going to do the extension of the PI of, of the proximal and distal interphalangeal joints. So it is quite possible not to do the reconstruction here and the patient can still extend their fingers up to about that level without having to do a full opening up of the hand. And for many people, um, that might be a better option for them if depending on the resources available and how they can get back to do hand therapy. Actually, the next question, I think I've already answered it. Someone was asking about skin grafting over the, par the par par paratinon um, and then secondary grafting. In fact, that's, uh, I don't know if that was posted before or after, if that's, but I think that I, I think I answered that already that yes, that is definitely a technique and much cheaper mm -hmm. than doing dermal substitutes. Yeah, as long um, as you've got a glide. As long as you've got a bit of glide, yeah. Um, On that question, how long would you normally wait for the graft to mature before doing fat grafting? Well, I'd want to give, have also given them a go quite a while because actually not only do I want to have waited for the graft to mature, I want to see how much they can movement they can get and how much glide they can achieve through hand therapy, first of all. So I think you're looking at a minimum of three months. And do you mind particularly where you take the fat from? Does it make a difference? I, I, I don't mind, but I tend to just go infraumbilical. You just um, do that for fairly short zones. It, 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 um, I, I would anticipate that 
that that would be a you know if you've got a fairly short segment of graft yeah i mean i've, I've as i say i think i've only done it in defects five by five centimeters yeah, yeah. i haven't done it over larger so i've not got experience of anything bigger than that um, mr deshmuk did you have a point to make you're I still muted, muted. You're muted, Tiba. Still muted. There we go. I had a small point to make regarding the uh, extensive tendon reconstructions, especially in the zone six, seven, and eight, if you don't mind, David. Uh, if your reconstructions fail for any reason, for example, you've done multiple tendon graphs or multiple tailed tendon graphs and they fail, is MCP an option in terms of good? and a DIP function because I used that in the past and I found patients reasonably happy if you do an MCP fusion in a sort of a 45 or 50 degree flex position which uh, prevents the uh, patient from having a completely dropped finger. Yeah, I, th I think it depends which, which fingers involved. Um, I try and avoid um mcp fusion sorry you, you cut out it was an mcp fusion you were talking about yeah um i i try and avoid mcp fusions um in the main in the index uh, fine because it's a it's a nice stable uh digit for the for the other ones um yeah i well i've, I've not had to do it yet um more distally yes um uh, and it, it and it, it's one of the things actually that once uh, if, if I can sort of take your question and take it a bit further on, once you get multiple layers involved, the further you go down the fingers, you're doing more and more work for less and less gain. Um, yeah. And so um, certainly around the, the DI, so, so once you've got sort of bony injury, tendon injury and skin injury, you can automatically assume that you, everything is going to stick. So if you know that everything's going to stick, uh, you can actually then build that in for your into your um, uh, telling the patient in terms of expectations of what's likely to happen. It is going to stick. You are going to need more than one option, um, one operation. And so consequently, then you can build in. Well, actually, here's here's a single stage thing, which might seem a little bit radical. But why don't we just fuse your DIP joint or why don't we just um you know take the finger off at this level or whatever and you 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 can then bring in some single stage options because you know because multiple structures are involved that you're going to need more than one operation and certainly a lot of the farmers around where we are is just whatever you do i want it to be quick i want my hand to work and i need to get back into the uh, it, out onto the farm okay. okay three more questions katie next one um, so this question is about uh, in zone five. How important is it to repair EPL over the extensor retinaculum? Not important. Um, and still on the subject of the extensor retinaculum, how to reconstruct it? Uh, if, if you're going to do it, um, it, if it's part of your flap, as I say, we, we, as you put the fascia down on the underside of the fascial flap, uh, you can just stitch that to the edges and that, that provides a little bit of support. Um, if you're really going to go to town with it, well, you can take a bit of Palmaris and, and do a sort of a, a loop backwards and forwards. It depends on the gap um, or whether you've whether it's just simply open uh, or you can make a couple of little step cuts and and and, and sort of transpose a, a, a couple of steps to close it. Uh, it it depends on what you've got to work with then the, the other option is you can always just go to the other wrist if it's undamaged and take 50 percent of it across yeah. and just take it to the other wrist and put it across mm -hmm. next well um and we've also got a few questions in the chat that i'll go through as well so this question um is a very good one and i was going to add a little bit to it whether in my country is hot and sweat how can the patient maintain hand and finger hygiene using orthotics slash splints? How to remove and place the splint without harming the healing of injured tissues? And then um, maybe after we've answered this, um, how would be for um, groin flaps, one of the biggest problems even in the UK, which has horrible weather, is making sure that it doesn't become disgusting before you're about to try and divide divide it and um, 
So if we could then ask a little bit about growing FAPS as well, that'd be wonderful. Pascal, do you want to start us? Yeah, answer? definitely. Yeah, um, orthotics can be really sweaty. And also, particularly if you're using things like POP, they can be very heavy and bulky. But um, the thermoplastics are less forgiving when it comes to hot weather and you can get quite sweaty. And I think it's important to educate your patients about hand hygiene and regular and safe um, washing of their wound or hands. And it's about teaching them how they support that either under running water or particularly with mallets when they're doing regular changes, ensuring that the patient understands what structures they need protect to protect what they're allowed to move or not move. Um, and again, you may be also asking them to be doing some massage. So as well as hot and sweaty, there's gonna be layers and layers of cream or Vaseline. So I think really in having clear instructions for your patient about when they can wash and how they wash um, and protect the healing structure. Um, keeping the splints on the easiest way. So here, um, again, with POP, I've layered this with the actual cotton. And I think in some places they even put um, the POP, once you've wet the POP, you put it through the tubey gauze and then you can mold it on the patient and the, the splint becomes more reusable. But a lot of the bigger splints, you're just going to be able to bandage on. And I think it's just a case of regular removal to keep an eye on um, the skin to make sure that it's not macerated. Thanks, that's really helpful. Um, did anyone have any uh, nuggets of gold about how to keep groin flaps hygienic? Other than Carlex. <laughs> I think there's there's often a fear about washing wounds. Mm. Uh, in, uh, you know, we, we're lucky. Uh, you can tap water is you know. I always tell my patients that tap water is so safe in this country that I drink it. It's absolutely fine to run any wound as long as there's not an exposed prosthesis or stitches um, o o over a wound to wash it. And I think that's part of the problem is that things are left too long without any appropriate cleaning. Um, so I, I, I think it's just got to be attention, close attention to wound care, changing dressings and uh, washing when appropriate. So a very similar answer in a way to both of you. I mean, yeah. Lots of hygiene and, and talking to people. Mm. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to take a couple of questions from the chat so that they don't get lost. Um, so one was more a comment on uh, the number of strands in a core suture concocted and that balance of compromising vascular supply to tendons versus making sure that you have a, a strong suture. Does anyone have any particular views on types of core su sutures in extensor tendons? In, in extensors? Mm. Um, yeah, so, so, so for me, the... the the difference between flexors and extensors is the load that they need to take. Um, so it, the extensors are thin and they're flat um, because they don't need to take a huge amount of load, but they do need to glide. Um, so if, if you think about it, when, you, when you're making a fist, that's, that's your, your strain and that's your flexor. What, what's the extensor doing? It's just getting your fingers out of the way. So there's, there's relatively few things that we do in life where you're actively extending and, and you're lifting a weight. Uh, and so the, the load that your extensor needs to take just needs to be enough to stop the tendon gapping and to allow it to heal. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, so, th so the combination that I tend to do is, uh, is off, it, 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 even once you're, you're proximal to zone five, um, it is often just a two strand, but then I'll, I'll, I'll because the, the tendons tend to be wider, I'll do a silver skull. Once you get back to the wrist and they're more like flexors, uh, I tend to do my usual four strand cruciate uh, with an epitendinous. That's for okay. me. I think we've just got time for a couple more questions. So, um, a Temporal fascia graft as a single unit interposed in zone six in, in um, situations in multiple extensor loss. Um, Anybody have any experience with this? No, but it would work. Um, it seems to be a, um, a relatively long run for a short walk, but um, yeah, it, 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 it'll work. It's a nice vascularized graft. Uh, it, it won't displace and uh, it, it'll give you a common EDC. Um, yeah, send us some pictures. Yeah. 
And then a couple more questions from the Q and A. Um, so one, when using a tendon graph, how do you calculate adjust the length of graft, which we sort of covered a little bit um, with Mr. Bell. Um, if you attended our last talk a week ago on Wallant, that's the best way to do it. If the patient is awake, um, obviously this is uh, a great way that Dave's showing now with uh, when the patient's presumably asleep. But if they're awake, actually the best way is to tension it with them actually actively moving it themselves. Um, but otherwise that technique that Dave just showed is excellent for a long extensors. Uh, flexors you tend to put in a, a bit tighter so the cascade at the end of the repaired finger is held in a bit more than the the, the, the other fingers at rest um, but the the best way is that if the patient's awake and then you can check it and I'll just send everyone the YouTube link to the last talk on Wallant and um, so that's in the the main chat for everyone and then um, in case of bone fracture, when fixed either with metalwork or plaster, when can we start early mobilization? So internal fixation versus plaster, when do we start mobilizing? Well, I think if they're internally fixed, then I would start mobilizing straight away and try not to put much of a plaster on. Uh, if I check the motion again, particularly if the patient's awake, and we've got the we're lucky enough to have mini C arms that I can actually visualize the fracture with the internal fixation or K wires in place. If 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 it's stable, then then I'll get them moving straight away with plaster. I guess it depends on the type of injury, but um, don't rely on the X-ray results to determine it because they'll be much later. Um, as again, Donald Lalonde said in the talk last week he doesn't go by x-rays at all because there's about a, a four, three to four week lag between um, consolidation seen on an x-ray and, and a stable fracture and he takes the splint off at week three or four presses over the fracture site if, if there's no further pain and he can not detect any motion then then he gets them moving straight away I would just say as a therapist, if we know that the stable, the fracture is stable, we will want to move it as gent and um, nice and gently. But also um, if the fracture isn't stable um, from a therapy point of view, you want to move everything above or below it to keep things moving as well. Just to add to that, I think one of the key things is you probably want to wait a two to three days for the edema to settle, even if it's a stable fracture. Yeah. Um, Wallant gives you that option of assessing stability straight away, in addition to your fluoroscopic assessments. Um, and the key with giving stable fixations is that you wanna get them moving. All these structures we've just talked about are so interrelated and intertwined that damage to one structure can cause adhesions, can get things stuck pretty fast. And the aim is to get them moving early so they don't get stuck. And you want that gliding layer that Dave was talking about to be not disturbed, function, do its job and get things moving. Okay, I think we'll uh, close up the question time then. That's bringing us directly back onto time. And next is my talk. So I'm just going to start sharing my screen. There we go. Let's just reduce that. Uh, so uh, there is the. Why is that? So the, so the, the next is on on flexor tendon reconstruction. Now the reason for that is that this, it covers a lot of the techniques which you would also use for uh, an extensor tendon, and also because uh, for those people, the ten percent of people who had attended yesterday's talk although some of the techniques will have been covered, this was to complete it. It was meant to be part of the instructional course today, which this is uh, replacing for the LMIC uh, participants. Uh, a slight apology if there are some people that attended the Flexor talk um, a month ago, that they, you will notice that some of the slides are, are similar. Uh, it just was to make sure all bases were covered. So obviously this is a picture of 
the uh, flexor tendons with the FDS going uh, to the middle phalanx, FDP going between the two, the A1 and A2 pulleys are shown there, via for vinculi, someone asked about the blood supply, they're obviously important for the blood supply uh, of the flexors. Um, so this is assuming that uh, yesterday they've already talked about primary tendon repair, delayed primary and, and a secondary delayed repair. And we're really going to be talking about tendon grafting in this talk. Uh, Paul Vitaft essentially said that uh, for a single stage, so if you're going to go straight to doing a, a tendon graft in one operation, then the overall condition of the, of the, of the finger has to be very, very good uh, with minimal scarring, full range or near full range of motion, good circulation, at least one digital nerve still uh, intact and um, a, a cooperative patient. So probably avoiding anyone under the age of three. The indications why you might want to do a single stage well, a double level injury or a segmental loss of a tendon uh, early after injury where primary repair wasn't uh, either done or, or not possible, but it's still not too late that you haven't developed a scarring so that, again, if the pulleys aren't contracted, then there should be minimal scarring and this applies to extensors as well, but obviously not a pulley system. Um, and in some cases, particularly maybe in LMIC countries, if the patient just can't attend for a second operation, then you will need a good soft tissue cover as well. Uh, Boys described these various levels of uh, description of an injured finger or inju injury to the hand. And he said, essentially, grades two to five, you shouldn't consider doing a, a primary one stage reconstruction. So it should only be in grade one, which is minimal scarring, mobile joints and, and, and uh, no nerve injuries and not multiple, multiply damaged fingers or hand. So your choice of tendons uh, will it'll be determined by the availability and also the length of the tendon that is required. The tendon must be thick enough to withstand the forces of early active motion, but thin enough to become revascularized. Um, and it's taking that tendon shouldn't cause a significant functional loss. So palmaris is probably the most commonly used. Here we see it's being harvested using a tendon harvester from the wrist passed up to the forearm to release at the musculotendinous junction where it can then be retrieved through the, the, the wrist and should normally give you at least 13 centimeters of usable length. Uh, it is absent in about a fifth of patient and that's normally on both sides. And uh, in the index middle and ring finger, it's normally only long enough to get to the palm. Whereas for the thumb or the little finger, you might be able to get to the forearm. You don't really want to be doing your repair in the carpal tunnel if you can help it because of the reduced space. Possibly a single repair is okay, but not for multiple repairs. So another option would be to harvest your plantaris tendon, which is found just uh, to the medial, medial aspect of the calcaneal tendon. Again, with a tendon stripper, you can of course do ladder cuts up the leg as well. Uh, but this is a elegant way of releasing it again at the musculotendinous junction and gives you a much longer length of tendon. Uh, normally sort of eight to nine out of 10 patients will have a plantaris present and it's unrelated to the presence of palmaris longus. Um, if you've got time beforehand, you can get an ultrasound scan to confirm it. Uh, it, it even when it's absence on one side, about a third of patient will still have one on the other side. And it certainly gives you a good length, about 30 centimeters. Um, and uh, because of its length, you, you can divide it into strips. So one uh, motor, one, one, one proximal stump can actually, as you go down, you can put it into various strips to go to several different fingers. If those two aren't available, then long toe extensors uh, are another option, harder to, uh, to raise because it's stuck. They're always stuck along their course at several points. So you can't use a tendon uh, harvester. You'd have to do uh, these step ladder incisions as shown here. There isn't one to, there isn't an EDL tendon to the, the, the big toe and on to, to the fifth toe, it's, it's uh, fused with the extensor digitorum brevis. So, that isn't a good option. So I tend to go for the fourth toe long extensor. Uh, 
Distally, there are various ways of attaching a tendon. This is again a flex tendons, but um, I guess you know similar techniques may may be adapted for extensors. Um, the button technique is commonly used when buttons aren't available. And if you use a the plastic um, the, the plastic uh, circular disc at the end of the plunger of a of a five or three mil syringe it's very equivalent to using a, a, a button with gauze underneath it I tend to use a 3o proline stitch which, which i would then normally leave in for up to six to eight weeks before removing if you've left a distal stump then you can attach directly onto it or you can use a bone anchor or actually more commonly i will just do a transverse bone tunnel which is the same as a bone anchor uh, and uh, in the distal phalanx and use that technique if you're unsure about your repair, and this is someone talking about how to do adjustments of it in the questions, you can bring it out through the pulp and tie it onto the nail. And this is the only technique that allows you to adjust it later on. And um, in these situations, you then again would leave it for about eight weeks before simply dividing the, the tendon at the level of the pulp skin. Uh, unfortunately, it can leave a little indent and be a bit painful. So patients often don't like it as much, but if it is a technique where you can adjust distally. We tend to use uh, in the UK, this instrument, which is the, the Pulvertoff weaving instrument. Um, there is a sharp tip to it, which allows you to pass it through uh, the tendon. In this case, uh, a graft is being budded onto an adjacent long flexor, which is still intact. Um, and uh, you can still do the same just with a blade and forceps carefully making an incision, passing a forcep through and grabbing it. But this allows it to, you, you to put the tip directly through the tendon and grab the graft to pull it through. Um, you need to do four or five passes and you should not put them through all in the same plane. So in here you see the tendons coming in from uh, the three o'clock and coming out nine o'clock on the tendon. The next pass would be from 12 o'clock through to six o'clock and then the next pass again from three o'clock to nine o'clock so that you're not putting them all through the same uh, bundles of collagen fibers. Uh, then they're stitched together through various uh, stitches. I tend to use an ethibond, but um, something normally a non-dissolvable stitch or possibly PDS. Um, and it produces a, a weave like this. It does cover quite a large area uh, once you've made the passes. And uh, it's certainly very, very strong and allows early active motion straight away. Um, and um, uh, is, is probably the, the most commonly performed technique. Um, it is more secure than end to end. And as I said, you need three or four slits to pass the tendon through. Uh, there are single stages that can be done. Uh, if it's a, this is again, still talking about a one stage repair, particularly for zones three, four and five. Uh, if a di di direct tenorophy can't be achieved, then you can pop in a, a, a interposition graph, not normally for defects larger than two, maybe going up to five centimeters. Um, or equally, you could do tendon transfer to, to either to the FDS or the FDP directly. So the two-stage reconstruction. So this is where it, you can't do the, the reconstruction all in one go, uh, particularly um, patients with poor sensation or vascular impairment aren't really good candidates still. Uh, and in extreme cases, you might want to consider an arthrodesis or amputation instead. So the first stage, you need to expose the full uh, length of the sheath. Again, if it's an extensor, then you're, you, 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 you're probably going to try and create a tunnel instead of opening up a whole sheath. It, you, may, you may go through different planes from the anatomical original position of the, uh, the tendon, but this is, uh, talk is, is about flexor tendon. So you're exposing the sheath, removing any of the scarred tissue, uh, normal pulleys leave in place. Um, the FDS, if it's still there, the distal stump, leave the chiasm in place. And this is to prevent a recovatum, uh, an hyperextension deformity at the PIP joint because you, you're unlikely to you, you reconstruct the FDS. This is a two-stage reconstruction. You are just talking about just re repairing the FDP. If the FDS was intact, you see a, a better option might simply be just to have fused the DIP anyway. So this talk really is about if you both FDS and FDP have been uh, damaged and with the two stage, you are looking to reconstruct the FDP tendon. Uh, 
So the FDS is the, the chiasm of left, left in place to prevent hyperextension. FDP should be taken back to the palm uh, and the distal one centimeter on the distal phalanx should be left in place because you're gonna suture to this at the end in the second stage. Any scarred lumbrical should be removed and this is to prevent the lumbrical plus finger whereby the scarred lumbrical is actually preventing uh, the finger from flexing in. So uh, yes, as I said, uh, if there is hyperextension at the PIP joint, then another option would be the FDS tenodesis. I tend to put it around the A2 pulley as Phil Matthews demonstrated in his talk. Joint contractures should be released. Then you implant the silastic rod, so the silicon rod, and this is to induce a pseudo sheaf, but of course you're placing it beneath as many of the pulleys that you've kept intact. Always put the largest silicon rod that will fit into a sheath. The rod should then be sutured distally to that one centimeter of FDP stump that you left in place and either left three in the palm or, or forearm, or if you already have the, the, the stump that you're gonna attach it to, I know some people do attach it to that, I, I tend to leave it free. And if necessary, you have to reconstruct pulleys at this stage. Second stage, well, it's determined by the state of the finger and not by the calendar. So the skin should be soft, joints mobile, and a good passive range of motion. So essentially they should have spent a lot of time with the hand therapist just to maximize the range of motion of that finger and also to soften up the scars. The old incisions are opened. You don't need to open the full length of them. Uh, the rod is then replaced by the donor tendon and you, you start from removing the rod um, so that you remove it from the palm and, and you're gonna attach the graft at the end. So it's pulled in from distal. So the distal attachment of the graft is then done first as this next series of pictures will show. Uh, not quite yet. So the DIP uh, must be able to fully flex once you've done your distal repair, and make sure that it's not catching on the A4 pulley, and then you should modify the anastomosis and not the pulley if there is catching. So then just uh, try doing the distal repair once again. And the proximal tenorophy, either in the palm or forearm by a pulvitaph weave, as I've demonstrated previously. And tension should be, as I described earlier, slightly tighter on the operated finger because there will be some stretch afterwards. And you can check this by doing the tenodesis effect with a sleep, a sleep patient whereby you take the wrist and you bend the hand backwards and forwards and the fingers should bend in the same. And with the slightly re repaired one, it should be slightly tighter. So here is the beginning of the second stage. This is opening up the distal incision. So the old incisions are opened to reveal the silicon rod, which has been now in there for several months, creating a pseudo sheath. And it's been attached by that blue stitch to the remaining stump of the FDP tendon. Then you go to the palm and you open up the old incisions and find the proximal extent of the uh, silicon rod. I tend to mark it with a little blue stitch like this just to make it easier to find because the clear silicon rod can be surprisingly difficult to find. Then go to harvest your graft of choice. And then you're gonna pass. So here you see that the silicon rod has already been pulled out of the palm. But before you've pulled it, you've attached to the end of the silicon rod uh, at the fingertip, the tendon. Um, and that's been, as you then as you withdraw the silicon rod, the, the, the graft is being drawn into the finger. The same would be for the extensors. You've created your tunnel and you're gonna draw from uh, distal to proximal. And then you're going to do your pull it after weave and uh, in the in the proximal end. Uh, so complications will synovitis during the first stage can occur. So as they're exercising and up to about 20 percent of patients will get a bit inflamed, a bit painful in the finger. And then you just simply just rest it until that settles and then carry on until they've got their uh, full passive range of motion back again. Um, there can be migration. So yes, the distal ends can come detached and sometimes uh, come loose and the rod will start to work its way up the forearm. If this is detected, then you should proceed immediately to the second stage whilst there's still uh, an open sheath. You still can get adhesion formations. Um, the second stage, the, the rupture can repair, but that's most likely to occur in the first eight weeks. And you could try and immediately replace with another graft if possible. Uh, flexion contractures, the little finger, of course, is always the most likely to contract in. 
uh, recovatum deformity, which is the extensor, and this is avoided by trying to leave that um, chiasm of the FDS. And bowstringing may occur, as has been seen in this little finger, where the pulleys weren't reconstructed. Rare infections you can get, uh, sorry, complications you can rarely get infection. Um, you can try with antibiotics and debridement, but um, the few times I've ever come across this, the implant has had to be removed and then restarted all over at a later date. And if the distal end has detached and the patient is very actively flexing and extending passively, so passively flexing and extending to get that range of motion back, there's there going to be some pistoning of the rod. And you can occasionally see this where the, uh, the rod pistons and works its way out through the skin. Um, if it's pretty clean, as in this case, then I think it's reasonable to go straight on to a uh, second stage tendon grafting as long as it's felt uh, to be uh, safe to do so and probably cover with longer term of antibiotics. Right, so that's the normal way of treating, um, uh, doing a second stage using silicon rods. Um, I'm going to use this case study, and this is sort of to talk about something uh, a little bit different. So this was a 50-year-old right-handed gentleman, his left hand, he was a glazier, and he dropped one of the glasses. Uh, well, it smashed in his hand, actually, and part of the glass came down. And, 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 and went down and sort of ended up indenting on his distal radius, uh, causing this laceration here. It was during the lockdown um, in the UK. And so he, he presented three months later with uh, essentially unable to move his thumb at all, a wrist drop, um, not completely, but um, he certainly couldn't go in a radial dorsal direction. And uh, he had divided the following tendon. So that well, actually, first of all, we extended the wound as shown here. And uh, inside uh, was found to be a two to four centimeter defect in all of the following tendons. So brachial radialis, extensor carpi radialis longus, extensor carpi radialis brevis. Um, there were three APL tendons, um, which is quite common, of course. Um, there was an EPL tendon was divided as well, and I'm not shown here, EPV tendon lying along with the APL tendons were divided. So at this point, I'd like to put up a poll um, to see what options you may choose to... So injury to all the extensor tendons in compartments one, two, and three, divided uh, all tendons with a two to four centimeter defect. That's because they'd retracted essentially they, with the delay to presentation, they just couldn't be brought back together. So would you use tendon grafts taken locally? Would you use tendon grafts from a distal, distant location? So taken locally, in other words, would you borrow some of the tendons? So for instance, split part of the ECRL and ECRB to get your grafts uh, taken distally. So your palmaris, your plantaris, or maybe you'll use the tensor fascia lata grafts as David Bell showed in one of his reconstructive cases. Um, can do some tendon transfers, possibly a combination of the above, or is there another option that you would choose? So hopefully you have now voted on that. So can we in five, four, three, two, one, see the results? Combination of the above. Yeah, I probably shouldn't have given that option, should I? Because um, I don't know what you'd have gone for. But interestingly, there is a, a, a spread of other options there as well. So I'm actually going to talk about um, tendon turnover technique. Now, we've kind of heard about that a bit with the reconstruction of the zone one injuries that Phil Matthews talked about. So it's not a new technique. I tend to be a little bit odd and I use it quite extensively for flexors and extensors really throughout the, the upper limb. Um, so this is essentially the wound after we'd opened it with the extensions and you're seeing um, ECRL, which I've already repaired using a tendon turnover technique. Um, the two tendons to begin with were of equal thickness because the tendon next to it is ECRB. And you can see that the one I've repaired looks a bit thinner. And I'll, uh, as I go along this talk, you'll realize why. 
the actual turnover segment, uh, so here, here you can see actually it was slightly more than four centimeters defect uh, for the ECRB, and it was about four for ECRL. The turnover segment has actually got a little instrument between it. Um, this, th those two limbs of the turnover segment would later be stitched together. And again, that will become apparent as the talk goes on. Um, so what I'm doing with a turnover segment is I'm actually, rather than taking a, you know, I, I, I would very much in that case have previously taken uh, split tendon grafts from the ECRB, ECRL and, and weave them across. But with this technique, instead, what I'm doing is rather than completely detaching it, I'm, I'm just turning it over. So one centimeter back from the distal stump, I will make an incision proximally as far as I need to go. And that, inci that, that incision proximal is as long as the defect plus the one centimeter where the turnover has occurred. So it needs to be the length of the defect and one centimeter more if enough tendon is available. So I'm now going to play this video and just talk through it. So here we go. You see, I've cut back and released out the side. So that is now the same tendon turned over and through the dis distal stump at the end, I'm going to place a modified Kessler stitch. And that stitch is to stop propagation of the, uh, the, the tendons from splitting. Because actually, once you've done the side split and released across, you can just pull it and the whole thing will open up um, uh, along its fibers. So this is now to hold it in place. And you also notice that as you come back, go in and out of the, the, the distal end, once you place that final stitch, and I put four knots across it, then it actually flattens the two ends. So it's a little bit more bulky, but, but it's, it's, it's reduced the bulkiness and they almost fold back in on themselves so that the two halves of the, 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 the cut end are now facing each other. I then go on to put an epitendinous. In fact, I normally just don't cut that stitch. I then use the same three or four O proline if it's in a forearm um, to, to go right the way around. Uh, but, but here we see an epitendinous stitch in place um, around uh, after I've done that, that core stitch, the, the, the turnover point stitch. And you can see that it is a little bit bulkier than the, the two limbs of the turnover section, but it's about the same width as the original tendon was. You can do it from both ends. So you can turn two ends back and then you join them together. And this is the first stitch going in. And this is just to tension the, um, the repair. And if they're awake, I'd get them to move. Otherwise I'd do a tenodesis effect. If, it's not, if I'm not happy, then I'd go and redo that first stitch. And then I'm gonna just put a stitch either end and go all the way around the edges of the two overlapping segments. Um, just as an epitendinous. Now, by turning over in this fashion and joining them this way, then actually the exposed collagen is on the inside of this repair and the epitenon is left on the outside to try and reduce the amount of exposed collagen um, to the repair site because that will slightly induce um, some more scarring than epitenon would. And you can see it's quite a strong repair from me uh, just pulling it but we have gone on to test these in a laboratory in Cambridge. Um, so here we just looking at the thickness of the repair site. So this is one where I've turned over from both ends and you can see uh, the turnover, two thickest points of the turnover segment were about 7.8 millimeters. And actually it's thinner than the original tendon that it, they came from. Um, as opposed to a pulvertaft weave uh, where you see both in width and height, uh, the, the weaved area is in fact thicker than the original two tendon stumps uh, either end were. Um, so a pull tough weave is great, but as I said, you probably wouldn't want to do many of these in a carpal tunnel. There wouldn't be much room for it. Whereas maybe with the other technique you could because you don't actually take up any more volume. So I've just created a little classification system. Um, and this goes through all the various uh, configurations possible with tendon turnovers. So a 1A is whereby you do a turnover just of the proximal segment and it re reaches all the way to the distal segment. And as you can see here, the reason you can only do this one is because the distal segment is very short. And here I've put what I've called the turnover stitch, that, 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 that stitch you saw in the video. It's got an epitendinous around it as well. And then just a normal tenorophy at the distal end.
If, however, you have got the laceration and it's close to the musculotendinous junction, you can do it in reverse. So the distal component is turned back. Um, if both proximal and distal components aren't long enough to span the tendon defect gap, then you can actually do a turnover from both ends to get them to join in the middle as a tenorophy. Or if they happen to overlap, then you can overlap them in the in the the way I showed in that second video. And in fact, this has been shown to be slightly stronger in our studies than doing the type 2A. Um, stronger still is a, a 3A, and this is where essentially it's a 1A, but you do have some ability to turn back part of the distal component. Um, it's stronger because the turnover segment of the proximal component is actually reaching to the distal stump. But actually, by turning a bit back, you add some further strength to the repair. And of course, you can do it the other way around as well. So the, the main bit spanning the entire gap is coming from the distal stump. And a type four, which was shown to be the strongest in our studies, is that both proximal and distal stumps are meeting together. So looking at this gentleman whose images I've shown, so what I've done here is I've done a type four repair where both proximal and distal stumps could entirely span the gap, as you saw in that original picture where I was passing the instrument between the gap before joining it together. Um, with the ECRB, I could only do a type 3B, so the proximal component span the gap, and I've turned back part of the, uh, the distal component. With brachioradialis, I just did a 1A. There was only a small uh, distal component available. With EPL, um, it was originally going around Lister's tubercle. And what I've done is I've simply just taken it out of Lister's tubercle, left it above the extensor ret retinaculum, as one of the questions was proposing. And so it, it's allowed a direct repair. What I didn't show on, the, the, there's no markings for EPB. So I put that in here now in green. And as I said, with APL, there were actually three tendons in there in the first compartment. So what I did was actually take uh, one of the uh, distal uh, stumps as a free graft to uh, EPB, and uh, I've taken the other one uh, to repair just one of the APL tendons. Um, and here we is the gentleman three months down the line, he can uh, abduct and bring his thumb across. He can fully flex. He can almost fully extend. Uh, he can radially and ulnarly deviate and he can uh, supinate and pronate his, his forearm. I and mean, he's back to work. Um, he, in fact, he's decided to give up being a glazier and he works in a warehouse lift, lifting very heavy objects. So um, that's another option for reconstruction, which probably you'll less likely, less commonly seen. Um, in other areas. I have tried to do it in the zone one, two of the finger. I wouldn't do it in zone two, actually, but this is a, a zone one injury. There were three finger lacerations. Again, a delayed presentation due to lockdown of three months. FDS and FDP on, were 100% divided in uh, index, middle and ring fingers. They could all come together except for the FDP of the middle. Just couldn't get it to stretch out. And so the forceps are pointing at the distal end. There's a stitch going into the proximal end. You can see there's about a two centimeter gap. So David Elliott, one of our hand surgeons, uh, esteemed hand surgeons in the UK, he had written a paper previously called uh, the, the FDS, FDP demi tendon. And this was in cases where you couldn't pass the FDP through and under the A4 pulley, he said, we'll simply just remove one of the bundles. So the FDP, is, as I'm sure most people know, is formed of two uh, large bundles uh, with a central cleft. And by simply uh, removing one of those uh, proximal to the A4 pulley, you can pass the other one underneath. And he went on to show that this is perfectly strong enough repair with just half of the tendon to be able to actively mobilized straight away and for long term, no, no increased risk of ruptures. So I thought, well, I'd be very clever here. I can't quite get it to the distal stump. So I'll just do a very short little turnover, pass it under the A4 pulley uh, and uh, the A4 pulley going across uh, distal to it. And as uh, out straight, you can see it wasn't quite abutting the A4 pulley. And when I flexed it up, it didn't quite get to the A2 pulley. 
Um, I would normally do this type of thing with the patient awake, but with this number of uh, digits, I did decide to put the patient asleep. So I couldn't actively check it at the time. You can see it's a little bit bulky uh, than I would have liked. Um, and certainly in his re recovery, his middle finger has been the stiffest of all the fingers. The other two, he can now get into the palm. The, he's only got about five, maybe 10 degrees of movement at the DIP joint, and he can't quite get fully into the palm. So I am going to go back and do a secondary tenolysis. So what other options could I do, have done? Maybe I should have done a direct interposition. I think that most of the other options would have required a two-stage repair anyway. So if I'd done any form of, put a sort of rod in there, it meant I was coming back. Um, if I'd removed the whole thing back to the palm, I'd have had to take a graft from somewhere else. Possibly that would have been a good option, but I probably wouldn't have mobilized him as early as I did with the other fingers. So overall, I'm pretty happy that once I've done my tenolysis and got him moving, he's essentially got a two-stage reconstruction. But the good thing about this is it was definitely the quickest option, and I haven't uh, taken any grafts from elsewhere, which might still be needed. Well, actually, there is a turnover technique already described back in 1969 when Paneva Hovelic described her, she didn't call it a, a, a turnover technique, but she used FDS and FDP stumps, where in stage one, the circle, red circle in the palm, you see she would join the FDS to the FDP. And then at stage two, she'd leave that for at least a month, um, maybe six weeks. And then at stage two, she would divide proximally the FDS and turn the FDS tendon distally then through and into the finger to attach to the distal phalanx. Um, and the fingers were then powered on the flexor digitorum profundus just as a single tendon, as most of these secondary or complex reconstructions are anyway. I have to say, I, have, I think this technique with the turnover, you would be able to just do it with a single tendon, be it your choice, FDS or FDP. FDS is probably easier because there isn't a lumbar call and it's more superficial. Um, and you could turn it over. And from my calculations and from a cadaveric study, there should be enough uh, distance with a turnover to do in one stage, uh, turnover right the way through zones two, two zone one and insert onto the distal phalanx. But I haven't yet found a case. And if ever, anyone beats me to it, please let me know. Um, right, so there we go. Thank you for listening. And just the final poll, if we can, on this. If you're still there, Katie. So, um, have you heard of the tendon turnover technique in the past? This is just for really my own benefit. I'd be really interested to see. Not heard of it before. Not this is when I say that this is not including that technique, which is used quite widely for uh, uh, zones four, five, sorry, four, three, two, one of the extensors. This is sort of using it for the long extensors or flexors. Um, have you heard of it before? Um, you've heard of it, but not used of it. Do you use the technique as I've shown it, or do you use a different form of tendon turnover technique from what I've shown? And I'm just going to give you five more seconds. So five, four, three, two, one. And could we see the results from that, please? Not heard of it. Heard of it, but not used it. Use the technique shown, 9%. I'd be very interested to hear from those people. My email address is tonybarabbas at gmail.com. If you would like to write to me about that, that would be very interested. And I use a different technique. Also interested to hear what those 3% use. So thanks for listening. And um, I don't know how I'm doing time wise, but yes, I think we're just still about OK. So I think at the end, uh, well, actually, I've got a few minutes to I think we'll go on to the next talk. And what I'll do is if these questions are aimed at me, then I will answer those um, uh, either during the talk or at the end of uh, Subod's cases. So thank you very much. I just now to need to stop sharing. OK. Right. So Subod, are you there? You're there, but you're muted at the moment. Can we get you unmuted? And um, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, thank you, Tony. Uh, and uh, 
thank you everybody for attending this seminar. Uh, I hope you can see my first slide. Um, uh, so I'm going to show you a uh, couple of cases. Uh, these, these are very simple cases. They are not anything complex, but just to highlight uh, the problems you might face handling uh, delayed presentation of flex attendance. So here's my first case. So this is a three week old sharp injury to the palm of the, of the uh, right hand. And this patient has presented with a difficulty in flexing the middle finger. So the question would be, what's the most likely diagnosis? And I think that's a pretty straightforward answer here. There's an FDS and an FDP injury. The question would be whether this is a zone two or a zone three injury, because it could be uh, that the injury occurred in a flex position and the, uh, the, act, the actual injury to the FDS and the FDP is zone two, or it could be in, in an extended position and it could be in zone three. So if such a patient presents to you uh, three weeks down the line and has got a uh, sort of a, uh, a wound in the palm between the distal and the palmar crease and difficulty in flexing the middle finger at both the PIP and the MCP, uh, PIP and the DIP joint, obviously the MCP joint is likely to be flexing. How would you manage such a patient? And Tony has covered most of the stuff. I just, this, this will just recapitulate and put it in a clinical context. Um, the first point to look at for a clinician would be to make sure the wound is completely healed. Has this wound healed properly? Is there any sign of infection? And is there any active flexion left in the finger? Because if there is any active flexion, then uh, it, 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 it is a quite a different scenario. Assuming that there is no active flexion in the PIP and the DIP joint, then one must assess the neurological status of the finger, check if there is any sensation on the pulp of the finger, and is there any loss of sensation on the radial border of the pulp, on the border of the pulp, and also check if there's any neuroma formation. I think one must accept that the neuroma formation can be a bit tricky to evaluate at three weeks, but there might be some signs of a neuroma if you tap the scar and there's significant pain, then you might think that there might be a neuroma which is occurring at that stage. Now, the more important bit here now is to assess the passive mobility. Now, at three weeks, it is unlikely that the patient might have a stiff finger, but sometime if there has been a significant uh, swelling following the injury or there has been some infection, then one could assume, uh, one, one might have some stiffness in that finger. Now, if you have a finger which has, a has full passive mobility, then one could consider an early exploration. Uh, if the patient uh, has got full passive mobility, then at three weeks, it is highly unlikely that the flexor sheath would have collapsed. And one can excise the distal part of the FDP and the FDS, and one can consider a palm RF longus graft. The problem is that at three weeks, it is highly unlikely that you would be able to bring the uh, end of the tendon to each other, uh, approximate them to each other, and actually do a direct repair. It, I have tried that in the past, and it can be quite difficult because uh, if you try to repair them, that the finger is in a very significantly flexed position, and you might find that the finger never actually extends afterwards. Um, if you feel that it can be achieved without causing significant flexion, then do attempt a, a primary repair. But at uh, three weeks, you are more likely to consider a one-stage palmaris longus graft. As Tony has uh, already said to you, uh, you can keep the distal end of the FDP intact, and you can just do a one-stage palmaris longus graft, which will do quite well. As, uh, and uh, just follow the principle which Tony has just said, basically use a pulver tough view proximally, and you can anchor the distal end of the palmaris graft in the distal phalanx. Now, there is a possibility that at, even at three weeks, the flex sheet could have collapsed. Now, that would create some other problems. Essentially, you can't then do a one-stage palmaris longus graft. You would then have to consider a 
two-stage palmaret longus graft, which is to put the hunter saw elastic rod in, attach it distally, and keep it for three to four months. Make sure that finger gets a full passive mobility, and then you can uh, railroad a palmaret longus graft through the through the tunnel created by the saw elastic rod. Obviously, the uh, the timing would depend on uh, whether the patient has achieved the, the full passive mobility because that is absolutely the crucial part of considering the, 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 the two-stage graft. Mr. Tashmark, yes. is, is it possible to use presentation mode? I think it's yeah, okay. a bit okay. small. Okay, fine, fine. Yeah, okay. Right. Thank you so much. Okay, no problem. Just let me just, uh, yeah, okay, great. So the, the finger is stiff, then the, the problem would be that you would have to consider trying to get some good passive mobility of the joint. And that could take a long time. Sometimes it can take up to three months, sometimes a lot longer than that, but you just have to wait because if you don't have good passive mobility, it is highly unlikely that any graft can work on a stiff finger for you to get reasonably act good active motion. But once the full passive mobility is achieved, then I'm absolutely certain that at that stage, the flexor should, the sheath would have completely collapsed and then the only option would be to do a two-stage graft. Uh, I think a one-stage graft is highly unlikely once you have got a stiff finger. Uh, now, if there's a digital nerve injury which goes with it, then um, uh, another problem crops up because at three weeks, it is almost impossible to repair a digital nerve. I think up to seven days, maybe up to 10 days, you can consider repairing a digital nerve, but at three weeks, it is highly unlikely. Once you explore the uh, patient, and then you have to look for, it for uh, if there is a neuroma formation, and then if there's a neuroma formation, there's no option but to excise it and bury it in the adjacent lumbrical muscle. And if you are keen on putting a nerve graft, you can take a nerve graft from the medial cutaneous nerve, the forearm, or any other nerve which you prefer, and, and you can put that in the gap which is created, and then you can probably prevent a neuroma. But if there's no neuroma, then you have, again, a choice. You can either put a nerve graft, or you can just bury the proximal end of the digital nerve into the lumbrical. Now, um, I think the, it would be pre uh, preferable to use a nerve graft because that would give the patient some chance of getting some sensation or some protective sensations back in the, in the pulp of that finger. Now you might have to put two nerve grafts if there is, if both digital nerves are involved, but generally it is unlikely to have, unlikely for the patient to have both the digital nerves injured when the injury is in the palm. Right, so I go back, go to the next case. Now, this is a slightly more complex case where a, a patient has presented with a 10 day old stab injury. Now, this is a small injury to the PIP joint or the volar aspect of the PIP joint, the middle finger. And uh, there is a obvious infection. The patient is unable to flex the DIP joint, patient is unable to flex the PIP joint, and there is infection. Now, if patient obviously is complaining of a swollen finger and a throbbing finger. Now you have two problems simultaneously, and this is not an uncommon problem in, in patients who present late. They have a, in, a, a wound on the volar aspect of the PIP or the DIP joint, which is attempting to heal, but there's infection and the sheet has probably closed down and there is some infection in the flexor sheet. Now, th so you've got to deal with two problems at the same time. So the diagnosis here is likely to be an FDP injury. There might be an FDS injury to go with it. And there's a secondary infection and this is causing flexor tenosynovitis. The wound also may show signs of infection and there might be pus pouring out from the wound itself. So there could be multiple issues here. How are we going to manage such a problem? Well, the first thing to look at is the management of flexor tenosynovitis. Uh, I'm sure you have you are reasonably conversant with it. I'll just go through it again. That the unless the infection is sorted, it is highly unlikely that you can even consider doing anything for the flexor tendons. Uh, 
So my point is that if the wound is healed, do not start antibiotics immediately. I think the antibiotics will will make making a, a, a bacteriological diagnosis quite difficult. So I think the antibiotics would have to be started post-operatively. If there's an open wound, you can consider a deep swab, start some antibiotics, and then consider surgery. If the wound has closed, then you would have to wait until you consider surgery. Now, that surgery would have to be considered fairly quickly because if there is flexor tenosynovitis, then the flex, whatever flexor tendons are intact, then there is a risk that these can get affected. So you would have to take the patient to the wound uh, to the to the theater as soon as possible, probably in the next 24 hours. Then debride the wound if it's open, and if there is a clear cut abscess, then uh, decompress the abscess. Take the swabs and send the swabs for culture and sensitivity. Um, now the wound will have to then be expo uh, explored proximally and distally, creating viable flaps. And you have to create a transversence in the proximal palmar crease to give a good and a thorough washout of the flexor sheet, the way you would deal with any flexor tenosynovitis. You can use a catheter, you can use uh, an epidural catheter if you wanted, and give a, 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 a significant or a, a washout using uh, copious saline. If you uh, like antibiotics, uh, antibiotics as well. You can use antibiotics to go with it. Now, this is the way I would extend the wounds. You would, uh, I think, uh, a transverse incision along the uh, DIP crease, a longitudinal in incision on the mid-lateral border of the middle finger, then extending into the uh, PIP joint, excising the stab, uh, stab incision, and then going proximally. And then you would have to have another incision in the uh, palm as well to access the flexor sheet just proximal to the A1 pulley. Now, one has to inspect the flexor sheet, document the extent of the retraction of the flexor tendons proximally. And at 10 days, you're likely to see that the flexor tendons have retracted at the level of the A1 pulley, creating a significant gap in the A in the area where the wound has occurred. Now, there's always a temptation at this stage when there is infection to tag the tendons and tag the nerves. I personally think that tagging tendons and tagging nerves at this stage would create even more problems because you try to pull the tendons back towards each other and you introduce foreign material, which is essentially the suture material, and there's already infection in the flexor sheet that would create trouble in my experience, and I would not tag the tendons or the nerves. I would just leave the tendons the way they are and make sure that the infection settles down, settles down quickly. Now, you have to commence the patient on broad-spectrum antibiotics and encourage very, uh, 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 very early passive mobilization, because obviously the patient is not going to be able to do any active mobilization, but with the help of the therapist, get early passive movements and rely on your antibiotics and your good washout to get rid of the infection as soon as possible. Now the infection might take two or three weeks to settle down and that in that time you must try to get your movements as much as possible and try to get your finger as supple as possible. Now at the end of say two or three weeks after the wound is healed you have to then see if the finger is Supple. Now, um, uh, Tony has just shown you a slide which shows how you can classify wounds or the suppleness of a finger. But essentially, if the, the scar is not adherent to the underlying flexor sheet, and if you find that the finger can be passively flexed fully inside the palm, and there's absolutely no sign of in infection, then you could consider a re-exploration. However, in terms of inf infection, once you explore this flexor sheet, it is highly unlikely that the flexor sheet will be intact. It is probably completely collapsed, and you, you could uh, consider a palmaris longus graft as a one-stage procedure, but this is highly unlikely. In, 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 in terms of infection, the, the flexor sheet would be probably collapsed, probably adherent to the underlying tissues, and you would probably have to consider a two-stage Palmaris longus graph. 
And again, doing a two-stage Palmer is longest graph, you have to be absolutely, absolutely certain that there's no underlying infection because it might be that the the, the infection is quite is nicely healed up superficially, but there might be some deep-seated infection. So deep swabs would have to be taken. And if there is any infection, then that, 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 that could create some trouble. But assuming that there is no infection, which is deep-seated, then you can do your two-stage Palmer as long as graft, which is the more, more reliable procedure. Use a hunt silastic rod for two or three months, and then you can consider Palmer as long as graft. Thank you very much for uh, listening to me. Just two simple cases, and hopefully this will help you to uh, sort of formulate your treatment plan for some sim similar cases. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks very much. Sit, sit up. Oh, am I? Yeah, I'm not muted, am I? Um, right. Well, there we go. We've actually finished early. Um, now, if there are any more questions, I think we've pretty much answered them as we were going along there. Could you see any particular interesting ones, Katie, that you felt should be answered to the cold group? Or I think I would like to know what uh, Leviat lengthening is, please. <laughs> My question. Oh, that's whereby you, um, sorry, yes, Jill Smith said, if you've got a small uh, tendon gap, as in that case where I did the tendon turnover in, in the, uh, uh, the finger, the middle finger, she was suggesting doing tendon lengthening at the muscular tendinous junction. So there's normally about two to three centimeters um, where the tendon is started to blend into the muscle. And mm -hmm. if you do oblique cuts, through the musculotendinous tendinous junction, uh, you can actually get some lengthening and get the finger out a bit further. Uh, I, I won't take that as a criticism, Jill, uh, but yes, that was another option for uh, for that middle finger FDP. Um, yes, any other questions? Um, and then lots of the other questions were kind of just going back over points raised in the talk and um, timing of tendon reconstruction, um, time is dependent on the patient's finger and sometimes the length of the waiting list um, yes someone said how long would you leave a, a silicon rod in well the longest i've left inadvertently was five years because the patient just disappeared off and, and didn't come back until five years later to ask when their second stage was and i don't know quite what happened there the shortest period again it's to do with the, they've got to have fully healed in so the scars are all supple and they're flexing passively all the way in and any of the releases that you've done are working. Um, I think you're still looking at a couple of months, probably, probably about three still minimum, but I'd be interested to see what other panelists think. Have you got any strict rules, other guy, you guys? Well, I, think, I think it's not just the uh, suppleness of the finger. I think you need to wait for the, the pseudo tendon sheet to form as well. So that... Yeah. Well, there are no real studies to tell us how long it takes for it to form, but I think the general rule of thumb is two to three months as a minimum. Yeah. If the patient has good passive flexion. So I would not do it before two months as a minimum. Um, that's really interesting. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Bell, were you going to add in? No, no, not really. It's just the, the pragmatics of my waiting list is that yeah. I'm trying to get something done um, from from one point to another point inside three months is is verging on the miraculous. So, um, uh, so, so, so three months is aspirational. Uh, it usually ends up being about five, but um, but three, yeah, I, I I don't think I'd do it inside three months. Um, and then we've got a new question um, about using the tendon turnover for a zone three flex and tendon injury that's um, a bit delayed by four weeks. What would uh, you think of that? Uh, four weeks, I would still try and repair uh, directly if possible. Um, and, and as Jill Smith has pointed out, there is the other technique where you can do release at the musculotendinous junction if it's a small gap. Um, certainly, I, I I think if it's in the flex, what's the question? If it's in the flexor sheath, um, it's for a flexor zone three injury. Flexor zone three injury, I think it works absolutely fine. Fab. Uh, and you wouldn't worry about well, a delay. Of four it, it works really fine with the, the FDS. The lumbrical can can be problematic, but we know the lumbricals come off the radial side, so you could do the turnover on the on the ulnar side, which should it should still work fine. 
but no it works very well in in zones two three four so it, it works quite well in the carpal tunnel as well because actually the turnover segment is no no wider than than the actual original tendon was because you've split two halves and then you join it back together um so um unlike a a, a, a pulvertaft weave that if you were forced to do it in the carpal tunnel it's just too narrow to do more than one or two uh the, the the turnover the technique not only does it take less room but you can adapt which ones you do so if you're if you don't want them all lying on top of each other you can do a type one for one and then if you've got enough you do a type one one a for one one b for the other so the repairs here you go in the middle so you stagger them so all the repairs don't overlap so each of them are moving in their own little segment and you're less likely to get sort of scarring across all the repair sites. So it actually gives you a bit of flexibility about where it is. So what I can't answer, but it hasn't been in a problem in the patients I've done so far, and I haven't gone in and done a tenolysis, is there is criticism about um, uh, the fact that you're strip. So if you take a, palm, a, a, a palmaris longus tendon, you've, you've got the whole tendon, it, we know it's strong enough, uh, and it's covered in paratenon. And we do know that exposing collagen will slightly increase the likelihood of adhesions. Um, but, you know, one of my other options is often on the back of the wrist to take uh, part of your ECRL, ECRB. You're also, if you're using a, a split tendon as a graft, you're also exposing a long segment of, uh, of collagen. And I haven't found in the turnover techniques that I've done to date, apart from that one that I'm going to go and do a tenolysis on, that I've needed to go back and do a tenolysis. Um, I don't do huge numbers of them. So, you know, that's why partly I was asking that question at the end. If other people have got experience with it, I'd be very interested because I only found one paper on it uh, described in the literature. And yeah, I'd been doing it for some years and it just happened that a load of medical students and junior doctors kept on saying to me, oh, I've never seen anyone else do this. So I put the talk together. It was a really good talk. Thank you. Oh, thank um, you. We've got um, a couple of people again, putting their hands up. If you if you would, have a question if you can put it in the chat I can put it to the panelists and um, I did have one more question myself for zone one extensor tendon injuries with very little or a distal stump what is everyone's preferred method for securing the proximal end the distal end I think you meant did you distal end. so there's no distal stump there's no distal end Okay. Uh, but yes, yeah, so, uh, the dist but still the distal end of the graft. I, yeah. I, I use what's called the tilt technique. Okay. So it's a transverse interosseous tunnel across with a KY. I didn't actually show mm -hmm. that technique, but it's uh, rather than use a bone anchor, you you do have to dissect a little bit further around the pulp to the sides enough to be able to get a uh, a K wire across, make a hole, then pass a, a stitch back through. Normally a three O proline through the hole and then that's essentially like a bone anchor and then you tie onto the distal stump and then normally well normally there is something to tie on to uh, put a few extra stitches into distal stump of fdp that's remaining um but that's my that's my preferred technique but but again it takes a bit longer time so if i've got bone anchors available and i'm doing multiple digits as i did in the other case then a bone anchor is going to be a bit quicker i might use that technique how about the others? Cool. Uh, for for extensors, I tend to use bone anchors um, in, into the base of P3. Uh, I don't tend to use that for flexors. I thought I'd try it. Um, I did three in about two weeks and I had two ruptures. So I think there's probably something wrong with my FDP technique. So I went back to the transosseous. Um, uh, so I, I, I almost invariably reattach my grafts for the, on the flexor side with that transosseous technique. So the, there's no button, everything's inside. Um, but extensors, I've, uh, I'm, I've, I've had less ruptures <laughs> with my Mitex. Same as Tony and, and David. Extensors, I use anchors, um, flexors, transosseous, drill hole through and suture it so there's no button anywhere. Okay. Myself, I, I use an anchor for all of my distal flexor, digital and profound distal ruptures or distal avulsions beyond A4 pulley. The technique which I've used is to make sure that the anchor is intramedullary 
it is actually lying horizontal in the distal phalanx, and that engages the anchor quite nicely, uh, rather than just going going vertically perpendicular to the distal phalanx. So I, I found that technique uh, a lot um, uh, sort of more secure. I said a little bit more difficult to put the anchor in the medullary canal of the distal phalanx. Once it goes in, then it stays nice. And do you have to drill a little hole to get? That's fine, yeah, you drill, drill a little hole and then make it a little bit more horizontal, so it goes into the canal. Okay. You can squeeze the anchor in, and then it is lying more ninety, uh, more uh, sort of almost parallel to the distal Four panel. Distal, and yeah. then okay. Panel, and then it seems to be more stable. Great. Okay. So no one likes using buttons. Used to. <laughs> Sometimes. Okay. okay. And I then. Don't have any nail problems. Uh, okay. so, so as a department we we moved away from them because uh, they just have a steady stream of people with deformed nails uh, when they didn't yeah. like them so mm. um and then just to go through a couple more questions one was how to test for the presence of plantaris which we have answered um ultrasound and then um surgically yeah so i mean if you haven't got time for an ultrasound i i've certainly explained to patients that i might just have a look and they will end up with a little you know three four centimeter incision on their medial calcaneal region um and and uh, they've accepted that as long as it, i write it on the consent form so they're aware that they're going to get a little incision there Bob. Um, and then one it normally, sorry, it normally means that the, the, the next option is to take a, 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 a toe extensor. Uh, that's what I tend to do, but maybe I should try the ten tensor fascia lata like Dave's done, because actually there's less mor morbidity from that. Um, but so they're, they're already expecting a, an incision on their foot in, 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 with me. Thank you. Um, and then one more question. Um, if we do not excise the distal parts of FTP and FDS, but rather reconstruction the FDP using tendon graft, can FDS be used as a graft in a zone two injury? Uh, well, normally you're only, so FDS and FDP, I will tend to repair both if it's primarily. Sometimes with the FDS, I might just repair one slip and remove half of it because we know that one is strong enough going back to that David Elliott paper, um, amongst others. And uh, so you're going to repair both anyway. If it's in a two-stage delayed reconstruction, then the FDS is going to be completely covered in adhesions and pseudotendon and stuck in, and both of them need removing. Um, so I guess there might be an occasional time when certainly maybe proximal to the a1 pulley there's a bit of fds you could use but it's probably not going to be long enough so but yes i suppose you could carry on harvesting the fds more proximal into the forearm to get a good workable length but i tend to just take palmaris because it's easy to harvest and a minimal incision in the wrist and oh. um, so i think we might be satisfied with questions. Great. Which is great. Um, so I think that just leaves it to me to round everything up. Is there anything else you're going to say, Katie? There's the, the next talk. Yeah, I was just going to advertise the next talk. Um, I'll just bring it up here. Um, so this is, uh, so if you go to the BCH um, website, bch.ac.uk you can see in the events we have a whole uh, schedule of events and this is the one coming up in July um, uh, you can book online alternatively all everyone who's attended today you'll be sent a link um, either tomorrow or on Monday to ask if you want to sign up for this for this next one and um, so and then if you go back to events in 21 you can um, see the online events that are being run um, I think that's, I think we've not put up the ones for the next few months, but they'll be, the, the aim is to run them monthly. So please do, do join. Great. So there is one final question. Would you inject prolotherapy injections along a tendon sheath to improve the strength of the collagen before doing a transfer? Never done it. Anyone else? 
no no sorry we, don't, we can't answer that one um but otherwise it just leaves it for me to uh, thank all my panelists for giving up their time on this saturday morning to give this talk uh and for all of you uh for attending it has been uh, i think a great session i uh, hope you continue to enjoy them uh please do fill in the feedback forms i think it might be compulsory for you to do that to get your attendance looks like i'm seeing nods by katie so that will encourage you to fill them in hopefully and uh unless sue wants to say anything further anything sue you wanted to add well just thank you very much it was a really great session really enlightening so it's right okay yeah. so uh yeah, i hope you have a great rest of the weekend wherever you are in the world i look forward to seeing the statistics on which countries and where have dialed in uh take care and thank you very much everyone goodbye Thanks, Tony. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.